just a tremendously large story, and it was all linked to the railroad. Book Notes, Sunday night at 8 o'clock, Eastern and Pacific, on our companion network, C-SPAN. Now we continue with today's House Government Reform Committee hearing on campaign fundraising. Former Democratic Party fundraiser Charlie Tree testified at the hearing, chaired by Indiana Congressman Dan Burton. There's a little over three hours remaining. Committee will reconvene. Uh, we had uh, talked to the council for uh, Mr. Tree, and uh, uh, want to make sure that we have a, 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 an ironclad agreement. And that agreement is, uh, as I understand it, that uh, we will conclude the hearing today, but Mr. Tree will remain uh, under oath and that uh, there would be up to two days uh, questioning by majority and minority staff uh, to conclude uh, any additional questions that need to be answered by Mr. Tree and uh, that that would be presented to the committee uh, after uh, that's concluded. And if that's uh, agreed to by counsel for uh, Mr. Tree, that's how we'll proceed. And we hope to finish if that agreement is agreed to uh, by no later than six tonight and probably a little bit earlier than that. Chairman, I, I would simply add the, the interviews will be conducted uh, uh, similar to the interviews that were conducted yesterday of Mr. Tree. The council have agreed and uh, it is the expectation that there would not be uh, absent extraordinary circumstances that have been explicitly discussed with council, there would not be further need for Mr. Tree's public testimony. The only exception to that would be after uh, we have agreed with the Justice Department that uh, regarding uh, Mr. Green and uh, Mark Middleton and, who, uh, who else? and Jude Carney, uh, those three, uh, we agreed with Justice that we would not uh, ask questions about those during these hearings, uh, which we will honor. But if after Justice concludes their investigations, there's a need, which we don't expect, then we might ask Mr. Tree for additional information, but barring that, that we would not see a need to have him come back. We have an understanding. Okay, we have an agreement then, and uh, we will try to conclude, and I will now yield to, is Mr. Barr back? Uh, are we going to, are we going to Mr. Barr or Mr. Souter? Mr. Souter, you're recognized for five minutes. I thank the chairman, um, and, uh, First, I want to express um, concern about some of the last questions with, with um, Mr. Barr, because there's really two types of things we're doing here. We're trying to see kind of, well, three. The global question of, of how, uh, this, what this money might have been trying to do. Secondly, looking at, uh, or accomplish, were people trying to buy influence in some way? Was it on purpose or accidental that some things got out in national security concerns? The second thing is, is what, what in the, is happening with the campaign finance laws and what do we need to do? And then thirdly, much like in, in Watergate, what parts were covering up or trying to obstruct justice so that we couldn't learn about the, the facts? Now, what, what I was concerned about with um, uh, Mr. Barr, maybe I'll make a brief comment and then yield so he can finish up, but that uh, what we saw in this, this last round of testimony is why many of us are concerned about some international trade agreements and things because um, it was kind of like, I heard you say under oath that that you were um, well. Other people would have sold the stuff anyway. You you appear to not have known what it could be used for, but you certainly didn't seem to want to ask very many questions. Uh, that's what similar what the Cox report told us, which was is that there in a reinsurance case, they found one part that in fact gave uh, the People's Republic of China the the ability to reach our landmass with nuclear missiles, but some people were so concerned about their insurance policies and so concerned about making the sale and so concerned that somebody else might get it anyway that
that our national security was compromised. And that's why uh, part of the point of these kind of hearings and oversight and reform is to say, look, our business community needs to be more careful about what they're doing and ask more questions. It isn't enough just to say other people are going to do it. Uh, I didn't know because uh, we've had serious breaches in our national security and if bio uh, uh, technology gets out and, and uh, chemical uh, weapons technology that otherwise wouldn't have been there, that's of deep concern to our, our government. I yield to Mr. Barr. Uh, thank you. Uh, following on the discussion, Mr. Tree, of the uh, bio fermenter, uh, since the sale of the bio fermenter that we were talking about earlier, uh, have you had any further dealings uh, with uh, Mr. Lozier? Mr. What's Mr. Rene Lozier. Is he from the uh, Suser? BioPro International Inc. I, I don't recall he was, this he name. He was with Solzer. Oh yes, okay. Prior to that, I mean, no, never, never have any contact. Okay. Uh, in other words, uh, documents in 1994 uh, between. Uh, you and Mr. Lozier would be would be uh, fraudulent documents. I couldn't recall. The, can I look at the document? Okay. The, the sale the sale of the bio fermenter was concluded in what did we establish? 1992. You testified, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, somewhere. And you, it was also your testimony that you only this was just a one-time deal. Yes, correct. Okay. There are documents here from 1994, as late as May of 1994, between you and Mr. Rene Lozier, discussing a continuing commercial relationship. Can I look at the, fact, uh, the, the sure. letter? And maybe then you can either change your testimony uh, or tell us that these documents are fake, which would be of concern to us. Mr. Chairman, while Mr. Tree is reviewing those documents, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to have uh, the packet included in the record. I made a mistake. They're all automatically done. But not these. Without objection, sir. Thank you. If I'm, if my, uh, re, re, reflection, re, collection, uh, correction was, after uh, we saw this uh, 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 machinery, I believe, uh, what's his name? He wrote, uh, Rene Loser. He, I believe, he wrote a letter. Is uh, I didn't read the letter, but he, I, in my memory, he, he moved or he be independent. He represents somebody else. May, that might be the case. So he wrote me a letter, and uh, maybe when we have the people coming, we just try to show people who we know, and we probably wrote a, a letter to him, but I don't, I don't believe we ever met. But the, these documents uh, before you, and in particular, for example, the January 10th, 1994 memo to you from Mr. Lozer, uh -huh. and the May 27th memo from Mr. Lozer to you, uh, you now do uh, recognize those documents, correct? Correct. Okay, so I mean, uh, Mr. Barr, uh, first, uh, your time has expired. We'll now yield to Mr. La Tourette. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to yield to my friend from Georgia, Mr. Barr. I thank the gentleman from Ohio. Oh, answer the why I have the. These these documents are evidence that oh, your okay. relationship with Mr. Lozer did in fact continue after the sale of the bio fermenter. Is that correct? 
uh, w uh, on the letter is uh, first is the DM Pili wrote. I tell her to write to whoever we have a contact with. But I don't believe I ever met him anymore. The the, way, the question you want. I, I I really didn't ask you if you'd met him. Oh, but I, well, my understanding was you think I met you know. Met no, him. I I you you're being very clever. Thank you. I never asked you if you met him. What I'm interested in is the continuing relationship between the two of you. People can have a relationship without ever meeting each other. They can communicate through checks, through memos, through faxes, through phone calls. These two documents reflect that you had a continuing relationship with Mr. Lozier that continued at least through May 27th of 1994. Isn't that correct? Correct. Okay. And this uh, most recent document, dated May 27th, 1994, indicates uh, very clearly that Mr. Lozier is corresponding with you in an effort to have you assist them in procuring additional equipment for sale to China. Is that correct? Correct. And he refers at the last paragraph of that memo to President Clinton. Is not that correct? Correct. In the January 10th, 1994 memo, there are several types of products in which you are engaged discussing with him, including incubation shaker cabinets, fermenter system, state-of-the-arts fermenter systems, that is, control systems, high-tech dryers and mixers for pharmaceuticals, sensors. Did you, in fact, provide any of that equipment? No. So the relationship with Mr. Lozier did not go beyond discussions of that possibility. You never consummated any further deals. I think so. Okay. You're sure? I'm kind of sure, because I only deal with them once. One deal, that's all I have. Well, we, we've already established that that's not true, so don't, I would, I would caution you no, not to. Sell, sell the machinery, that's only one deal. Right, okay. But uh, there, were no, there were no further discussions with him and no further sales. I, I don't believe I have any sale. Were there any further sales in which you were involved at all? I don't, I don't recall any. Were there any? I don't think so. Were there any? No. Thank you. Were there any further discussions regarding further sales? On this letter, yes. Other than but that? I don't, I don't believe so. Were there? No. No. Thank you. I yield back. I yield Thank you. As I explained, Mr. Tree, that one of the things is we're actually having several different lines of questioning. In my line of questioning, uh, for a period of time now, and we bit, we did this with uh, Mr. Wong and others too, because different ones of us have different sections of this. My lines of questioning is really going to be more. Uh, after the first articles broke, and I'm going to be asking a number of questions about things that happened after that, because I'm a little unclear on some of the, the facts. And exhibit number 233 uh, was a story in 1996, on September 21st, in the Los Angeles Times that first mentioned John Wong. Um, is that when you first learned about the story, or when did you first learn? That day, the next day, um, and what was your reaction? Exhibit 233, it's the first story that mentioned John Wong. Oh. Oh, apparently I, I, don't, yesterday. I don't remember the date. Okay. But um, I remember the campaign finance uh, broke off the first day was September the 4th in the uh, Wall Street Journal, if I'm not wrong. Um, what my question is, 
Um, it's clear you called John Wong on September 23rd. Do you know what you discussed at that point? I cannot remember uh, where he was in Washington, D.C. I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, the, reason, the, the reason I'm asking is because that's two days after the September 21st story. What I'm really trying to find out is, did you, when you first learned about this, did you talk to John Wong? Did you express any concern to him about the stories breaking? I remember it was, I uh, say, John Wong, you're a big man. And he, because he was on TV. I don't think I read the newspaper. The, um, on September 23rd, you don't remember what you talked to John Wong uh, about? The gentleman's time has expired. Without objection, we will, uh, since we have no opposition uh, to uh, time limitations, we'll uh, yield the gentleman uh, 15 minutes without objection. I thank the chairman. So, or, um, because what it looks like is something triggered a series of calls. On September 23rd, you called John Wong. On uh, September 25th, you called uh, Richard Sullivan at DNC. On September 23rd, you called Mr. Riotti. On September 26th and 27th, you called Joe Girard. Uh, that's a, a, a fast cluster of calls. And what I'm, uh, I want to ask you, you don't remember what you talked to John Wong about. But other than to say you, you think that may be when you said about TV, but you're not sure. Uh, for the my recollection correction was Jiang Huang was staying my house. I tell him that I talked to him. I don't think I make a phone call to him. People probably he stayed my house, used the phone to call those people. I never call James Riadi, never call Jiu Jiu never call who else what was the name? I didn't make the phone call. Who was staying at your house that day? Jiang Huang. Jiang Huang. So he was He probably called home. So when the Los Angeles Times story broke, the first national news story on September 21st, um, John Wong was at your house then the next few days? Uh, yes, I don't know. Not, I do not remember the exactly date, but he was staying at my house for, I think, for six or seven days, uh, if I'm not wrong. In September? Yes, I think so. Uh, how did, did you invite him to your house? Yes. Uh, because of the news story that was breaking, or how did you? Uh, I I remember because he said he was uh, under uh, uh, some people were looking for him to talk, but he lived uh, far away. So he said, "Can I can I stay in your apartment?" I said, "Sure." My my uh, my apartment was uh, empty, only by myself. Where were you living at that time? Uh, Watergate complex. Um, the. Um and you believe that the calls, you say you did not call Richard Sullivan? I don't really call, I call Richard Sullivan. And you did not call Mokhtar Riyadi? No. And you did not call Joe Girard? No. Um, that on the 27th and 28th, there were four to five more calls to Mokhtar Riyadi, but... I did not make any of them. Um, did Mr. Wong talk to you about those calls or what he no. might No. No. Did he tell you he was making those calls? No, he didn't tell me because I was a. Uh, sometime I go out. They, um, do you? Um, did you know he was making all these long distance calls on your line? No. Would that have bothered you? No. So, uh, do other people use your phone? I mean, that's those. Yeah, many people and... been. If they come to my house, they use the phone. Um, that. Um, on October 7th, John Wong's name was mentioned again in the national press, and you made another series of calls to key figures in this investigation. Um, and I'm going to ask you about a number of these calls, too. You called Melinda Yee on October 10th. Now, did you make that call, or was... I don't think so. I, I didn't recall I made the call. Was John Wong at your apartment again then? I cannot remember the date. What, what's the date? October 10th. I, I really don't remember. Melinda Yi, and who else? Uh, you called Cassidy and Associates three times on October 10th. Uh, Cassidy Associate. I don't recall his name. Uh, we wanted, my next question was, whom did you call, talk to on those three calls? You don't know who you would have talked to at, because I, I the lo phone logs show that you called Cassidy and Associates or someone in your apartment called Cassidy and Associates three times in one day, and we wondered... Uh, can I look at the name of the, uh, the 
associates. Uh, I may mean, have a memory Richard, on the telephone Richard number. Mays. Richard Mays. Richard Mays. Who else? Um, who else would be at the, the firm? We have, it came up in John Wong's or but I forget them. Maylene, Maylene Tom. She worked at the White House. I don't believe that's why I made the call. I and couldn't Cass remember, but I don't believe I never, I don't think I talked to Maylene Wong. It was at the Cassidy, Maylene but Tom. she had. Um, do you recall Cassidy and Associates at all? Did you? Uh, no. Who, who would be making these calls at your apartment? Do you have, did you, I mean, I'm trying to understand. Do you have lots of people who come through your apartment? Is it a place where business people stay? Is it a fair rare thing? Uh, I mean, these are, these are pretty high level calls to some pretty influential people who are involved in a lot of this, this entanglement. And the first group of calls, John Wong was your apartment and you, you weren't aware of what the substance was. And so on. now on October 10th, we have a whole nother flurry of calls that I have a whole series of questions about. And uh, who would, who would be making these calls to these high level people? Particularly high the, level the in the Asian finance. The older name community. you mentioned, I know them. Melinda Yi, uh, Richard Mays, uh, Linda Tom, uh, uh, Tom, Tom uh, Melin, uh, Melin yeah. Tom. Yeah. Tom. One more, more one more name. Um, <coughs> that um, partly under our agreement, I can't, I can't ask my next question. So I now, I, did you call John Wong on October 10th? I don't, I don't believe so. Where was Jiang Huang? What's the Jiang Huang number? You have a number for John Wong. That what happened was is that same week is when the New York Times and Wall Street Journal articles occurred. So the first rash of calls came out of your apartment after the story broke nationally. And then there was this rash of calls to a lot of the people who are networked in this that were trying to find out what their involvement was. Uh, Richard Sullivan, Mokhtar Riyadi, Joe Girard. Uh, then on October 10th, Two more stories break, and there's another bank of calls coming out of your apartment. And um, uh, we're trying to see if they're related. Uh, oh, or who I'm was making these calls then, if it wasn't you out at your number? Maybe Jiang Huang Lu stayed longer than I think, but I couldn't recall the time. As you testified earlier, you thought six days, did you say, originally? My thought is six days. I didn't remember. That was a long time ago. Because as people stay in my apartment, I never. I never, I mean, I don't care. Were you concerned that your name was going to be tied in with his since he was staying at your apartment and your name hadn't surfaced yet? We are friends. Yeah, I mean, I recall the words I used. So you're a big man. He laughing and he said, you'll be the next. And that's how I know. Uh, if we could put exhibit 235 up, which I believe is actually in uh, Chinese, um, but we have a, a transcription of it too. There's a news article in which John Wong stated that the time he was staying in your apartment, you wore a disguise whenever you left. Is that true? Did you wear a disguise during that period when you left the apartment? Uh, uh oh, okay. Do. Oh, which part on this letter? Oh, the uh, following page? That's not my writing. It's, the, it's in the last page on page four in the English translation. It says, in the evening, um, he had to buy food for him that you had to wear disguises in order to avoid being detected. That's the translation, so it would be at the end. Uh, it's on uh, page four, seeing the, the third line down. This is the translation. It says that in the evening, you had to, when you went to buy food for him, you had to wear disguises in order to avoid being detected. Is that statement true? Let me, let me look at it. Let me try. Look at this. Uh, I'm sorry, let me clear this uh, whole question. You think, uh, I know he was on newspaper. Yes, and he stayed in my house. But the, uh, the, you, uh, the question on this one was... Well, my that question is, is that uh, according to this article, while 
critical while he was staying that in order to buy food for him you had to wear disguises in order to avoid being detected and is that true what miss uh, i'm sorry what's a uh, disguise as something so people wouldn't recognize you uh it could be anything from a wig to uh okay uh, I, 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 I never uh, Disguise. Disguise. And then with disguise. So your testimony is that this is incorrect, whoever made this statement. I didn't. Uh, I buy food. I, I do. I did buy food. But you didn't have to. You didn't try to hide from it. You just went in as your normal self. and. Yeah, I just, because I, I wasn't. But what I'm, see, what I'm getting to earlier, I asked you, uh, were you worried you were going to be caught up in this as well? And um, and when you said no, that didn't reconcile with this statement that said that you were afraid of being identified and detected uh, during that period while no, he was... No, 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 I, I never was uh, uh, worried about myself. I don't have a no... Because uh, I wasn't on the newspaper. I wasn't, uh, I don't have to be hide myself. I don't know the reason I hide myself. I buy food for him, yes. So your testimony. I just go out. I I was go out every day. I never. Uh, what you call that? This guys. That um, were you? Cl you said uh, you had Mr. Wong there because he was your friend. Was were you close friends or how long had you known him? What kind of relationship did you have? Oh, uh, we know each other since 1994. Uh, oh, that was uh, I believe is an uh, Asian event and. Uh, Maybe people introduce him, but I know him. I know his name. Had he but, you know, he was working. I think he was working a uh, commerce department that in that time. I I have his uh, car, and uh, I went to his office. I remember will be two times, maybe no more than three times. Uh, we become friends. Did um, had he ever stayed at your apartment prior to this? Before the scandal broke, did he ever stay with you at your apartment? Uh, I couldn't recall, but yesterday I did uh, find out he was stayed there once with uh, uh, James Riadi and uh, who else. But I just let him stay. And I think did. because Antonio Pan was in the uh, uh, apartment. But this was pretty extraordinary for him to stay there a week, possibly, based on what she said a little bit ago. It could have been even three weeks. You're not even sure because um, uh, you recollected at least six days, I think you said, and then uh, then when I asked you about October 10th, you said, well, maybe he stayed longer, which would be another uh, week and a half to two weeks. That was pretty extraordinary. In other words, he had never stayed with you three weeks prior to the scandal breaking. Yeah. I mean... That um, in the... the um, you told the FBI that when you teased Mr. Wong about his name being in the papers, he responded, you're next. Is that correct, true? Correct, correct. Um, what did he mean by that? Asian community. I don't know what he mean about that, but he just said that. That's what I recall. Did it worry you? I'm sorry? Did, it, did you worry? Did it scare you? Did it frighten you? Not in that time. I was uh, him thinking you know, a newspaper is a. Uh, that's why I tell him he's a big guy. That um, did you discuss with Mr. Wong about how to avoid being next, about how you might get entangled to this and what could you do not to get caught up in what he was in? No, in that time I think I was worried about him because he was saying the the gentleman named called Larry Clement was uh, I, that's what I try to remember that, that conversation. That's why I know he was, uh, he said, Larry Kerman want to uh, interview him or something. Did Mr. Wong tell you what he was gonna do if he was subpoenaed to testify? Did oh he... yeah, he, I remember the words. That's the first time I heard the words. says uh, he might use the Fifth Amendment. And what did you interpret that to mean? So if that was the first time you heard the word Fifth Amendment, what did did he tell you what that meant? Uh, not a whole whole lot because I don't want to act like I'm stupid. He or he say that I just listen. So, I don't think he explained to me what's a fifth amendment. 
did he tell you that basically, did he describe it to you as saying uh, that this means we don't have to talk, we don't have to tell him anything? I couldn't recall that, that one. Um, did you ever discuss with Mr. Wong whether he was going to leave the country? No. I don't say him? Yes. I don't think so. So... He just my friend. I don't know what he want to do. Um, did you drive him around town on, in October 96 after his name appeared in connection? And uh, why would you have driven him around town? No, I, I remember he was saying he wanted to go to... Uh, let's call, let's a train, uh, a major train station in near Maryland. He wanted me to help me to, to go to his father-in-law's house to get a close. So he was his stay. That's why I drove him to there. Could that be where any of the dis the disguise question came up? Was e either you or he disguised so it wouldn't be known you were driving him? No. Um, in on Exhibit 236, um, the logs show that you called Mr. Wong 15 times in six days, October 25th to October 31st. Uh, do you know what you were calling him about and what you discussed in those calls? Do you recollect? No, I didn't make the call. Oh, I'm sorry. We had to pull 236 prior to the other uh, agreement. Um, does that mean I can't ask him about it either? Okay. Um, let, let's just, we because the log shows where some of the calls went, um, and a few of those we can't uh, discuss, that... Um, could you say what the general purpose of some of those calls were with Mr. Wong? What would you have been discussing? And do you recall? What's the date? October 25th was the first call. October 31st was the last, and there were 15 in six days. Uh, from uh, my apartment to where? To where? Can you tell me to where? Whether it's his office at Commerce or this, his, uh... We're checking. They could be uh, either to his... <clears throat> they would have been to his office, whether he was... He, what was clear from our earlier testimony is he had multiple offices where he would be. He was working while he was at the Commerce Department. He was also working uh, with a, uh, another agency across the street. Okay, it was both his office and his home. The 15 calls were both to his office and his home. From October. Watergate apartment. Oh, you mean where was your call from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it from his, probably from his apartment. That's the phone log bank. It's from your apartment. From my apartment. I, I didn't make the, the, those call. Who would have been at your, um, In that time, excuse, excuse I don't me. know. The gentleman's time's up. Uh, Mr. Hutchinson has uh, 15 minutes uh, without objection, and I don't know if he would want to yield to you any time to finish up. I'd be happy to yield to uh, the gentleman from Indiana. Okay, I, I will... Um, uh, I'm, so this is another time now. Who, who would be at your apartment during this period? Um, I mean, let me just give you what, what's troubling me. It's starting to look like Grand Central Station of an organized operation. I mean, I'm not saying anything, but you're telling me that after the first story broke, John Wong's at your apartment and there are calls going to Richard Sullivan at the DNC, to Joe Girard, to Mokhtar Riyadi, but you didn't make any of those calls. Then, when we start to go through a series of questions to key principles and investigation on October 10th, you didn't make those calls and, and maybe John Wong stayed longer than you thought. Now I come to the end of the month from October um, 25th to the 31st, and there are 15 calls to Mr. Wong, and once again, somebody at your apartment has made these calls. Did you have somebody else staying with you in that period that you know of, or who? Late in 1996, oh, Antonio Pan was to stay with me. So uh, Antonio Pan. I mean, I, I'm not a, quite sure, but I say late 1996, uh, uh, September, Antonio was there, but I don't know when he left. Oh, no, but in the, he probably already left. What was the but dates again? Antonio Pan. Yeah, what dates on Antonio Pan did you think he but was I there? couldn't remember, the, but he you know, should have have a record for the, uh, when he <laughs> go out of the country. But maybe Jiang Huang stayed longer. I just don't remember. Okay, let me, uh, I'm going to try to uh, jump some questions here. Did you talk to anybody during the, to the, at the Lippo Group during any of this period? 
from in uh, September, October, November of 96? No. When the scandal was first breaking, did you call anyone in China or Taiwan in that period in 1996 fall? If I see the no name, uh, telephone number, I will recall. I will know it's my call or uh, somebody else call. Um, but you don't recall talking to anybody about the press reports, the scandals breaking. You didn't make any calls that you know of to Taiwan or China about the, the press breaking in this story. I couldn't remember. Um, did you speak to Mr. Wu? In Lapsen? I don't recall, but I, I went to Macau after I left the country. What day did you leave again? I forget. Let One me. of them I remember was uh, somewhere around December. Okay. I remember, so it was, I it was after this critical period, but not very long after. Uh -huh. Did Mr. Wu or anyone else pay your attorney fees? Nope. Um, that, um, I'm going to uh, jump to another question. On, in, on December 16th, there was a White House Christmas party with Simon Chin, um, uh, attended that Christmas party, and um, did you use false identification to get him into the White House? Yes. Um, whose identification did you use? Rayma Paley. Um, did anyone give you a hard time about getting into the White House? No. Um, does he look like Mr. Paley? He's a dark eye. Didn't they, did they seem strange to you that uh, there wouldn't have been a more of a background check on a false I ID going into the White House? No, uh, not on the social party. Um, they just mentioned the name. Why would you have used a false ID? I remember that might be, if I, I don't know, is it right or wrong, but if I, I can check, that was for Arkansas, Arkansas people to go to the party. So I think use Arkansas ID, was which I have one. Was Renato Mapili, Mapili, yes. was he from Arkansas? Yeah, he's in Arkansas. Um, you were at that event also, right? I'm sorry. At the White House Christmas yes. party? Yes. Did you see the president? Yes. And what did you tell him? Oh, I, all I remember is I say sorry for the uh, trouble we caused. What did he say? He say, I'm saying, uh, can I have the, no, uh, yes, we will too. Okay, uh, something like he say, uh, I'm used to uh, this kind of attack, something like that. Did you miss, did you introduce Mr. Chin to him? No, not, not that party. Um, you said, um, sorry for all the trouble we caused? That's yes. What you just, who's we? Like, uh, this is a uh, campaign finance scandal. But who is the we? Rather, that, usually you use the first term, personal. Who is the we in that case? I just say it. I didn't mean the we or I. Um, the we wasn't John Wong, and and uh, it's an interesting choice of words because it's different than what we had in our previous depositions. And I know that your uh, is your testimony that you said we or I. I don't recall. Can I look at? But you previously had said you hadn't said we. That was just in your 302s. You had said I. Oh, I let me I. Okay. Um, one last question. Um, one uh, round. Uh, President Clinton said that you didn't know whether what you were doing was wrong, implying that it was a different culture. Do you agree that you didn't know what you were doing was wrong? Did you think it was okay to have a false ID to come into the White House when we have all kinds of security problems and concerns? Uh, did you think it was okay to break up the finance funding like that we've been hearing about here 
is um, the president made a statement that, for example, Senator Bennett of Utah was taken a task for as being a prejudicial statement. Uh, that somehow, and you said in your written statement, that in fact that this was to some degree picking on Asian Americans. Um, quite frankly, we're equal opportunity employers here. We pick on everybody who hasn't followed the law. Um, and that, um, and, uh, and I personally am unhappy because I believe it's wonderful to have Asian Americans, Hispanic Americans, all Americans involved in the political system. But the question is, what did the president mean when he said you didn't know whether what you were doing was, that what you were doing is wrong? I don't, I don't, I didn't see this. Do you agree uh, with that? I didn't see this comment. Do you agree with that? That you didn't know what you were doing was wrong? And if so, why didn't you know what you're doing is wrong? Your question is this uh, uh, ID. On the ID? Uh -huh. um, on, actually, I'm asking you a whole series of, of range. I assume he was also talking about uh, when you were given large sums of money, you assumed that that money didn't need to be accounted for in, in the normal ways that we, I mean, the way the law says. <laughs> um, that, that the question is, is that is the president implied that that's because in the Asian culture you weren't following, didn't feel you, you had to follow our traditional laws. And the question is, is was that a biased statement coming out of the president, or is that in fact true? That you thought uh, that, the, that, that you, as you've testified, you're an American citizen from Arkansas, why wouldn't you be following the same laws that everybody else was following? The same rules that everybody else was following? Why would, uh, or do you agree with the president that, well, that was a cultural thing? I cannot comment on what he say, but uh the time I made the Kangdu contribution, I knew was uh, I knew I was doing something wrong, but I didn't know, didn't understand the law of a campaign finance. I uh, thank the, the gentleman that. Uh, of course, one of the things we'll be probing here as we go through in the additional attorney questions is, to some degree, that's the problem of the National Democratic Committee and the President of the United States and other people who were, these calls were going to, to inform you. You as a citizen should know that too, um, particularly with the amounts of money you were handling. But that's also a responsibility of the people receiving the funds. And for them to excuse it and saying, oh, well, their culture's different, uh, it, it isn't. You're just as much of an American as I am. And we're under the same laws. And excusing it, that was a racial statement not us trying to get to the uh, question of, of the laws. But I thank you for uh, your time, and I yield Mr. Hutchinson's Would the time. gentleman yield for one brief question for me, please? Thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, Mr. Souter uh, asked you who we was, and you said you were referring to just yourself. On m most of the forms that I have seen at the DNC, uh, where John Wong was uh, involved, it had your name and John Wong's name on them. Are you sure that you're only referring to yourself and not you and John Wong? That's of 1996. I couldn't remember the exactly words I said. I just well, feel bad. I just feel feel bad. This uh, uh, this uh, campaign finance. I was in there. I was uh, feel sorry for him to cause uh, because that was right before the election. Cause a lot of uh, uh, negative. Uh, I know, but when you said we, were you referring to you and John Wong? Uh, on my way, uh, uh, I don't know the way, because everybody was involved in there. I thank the gentleman for you. I believe it's uh, my time, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for uh, uh, recognition. Uh, Mr. Tree, I wanted to go through a, a series of questions in a different area. Uh, I'm Asa Hutchinson from uh, Arkansas. Yes, sir. And, uh, <clears throat> I uh, wanted to cover uh, the appointment to the Bingaman Commission. Are you familiar with that? Yes. I believe uh, that commission has the uh, uh, official name of the Commission on United States Pacific Trade and Investment Policy, and that was uh, by an executive order uh, in J June of 1995. 
When did you first decide that you wanted to be appointed to a position in the Clinton administration? Oh, that was, uh, uh, one day I was in, I know that, uh, there's some point here. I was trying to just, uh, see if I, can I get a, a point? Let, let me see if I can put it in, uh, context that might be more helpful to you. Uh, the, uh, Bingaman Commission was created in June of 1995 by an executive order, and I believe uh, there's been some testimony through depositions and otherwise that uh, in 1995, mid-1995, you'd expressed an interest uh, uh, in an appointment. Uh, do you recall those discussions? Yes, I, I think I talked to Charles Duncan. And uh, Charles Duncan is with the, uh, is under uh, Bob Nash, I believe it is, uh, in the Office of Presidential Personnel. Correct. And uh, you talked to uh, Charles Duncan. Did you bring up the subject? Uh, can you wait a minute? Um, uh, I think uh, uh, Mr. Duncan mentioned to me this uh, position. Are you interested to help on the serve the commu uh, committee? All right. So Mr. Duncan brought up this specific Binghamton Commission uh, to you, uh, but prior to that, had you expressed a general interest in an appointment in the administration? Uh, yes. And who had you expressed that general interest to? I'm, I'm not supposed to mention the person's name. Uh, very good. Thank you for uh, 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 steering me away from where I'm not supposed to go. Um, uh, but, but is it safe to say that you initiated the general interest to someone in the administration of an appointment? Not in the in administration. In, in the White House? Not a, no, no. Did you mention it to someone who had influence with the White House, your interest in an appointment? Some people wasn't in the government. Okay. Would you repeat your answer? I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, someone is not in the government. All right. But you understood that, that someone not in the government had influence with the uh, White House? Uh, yes. Whenever you, whenever you said that Charles Duncan, who is uh, in the White House, uh, told you of the possibility of an appointment to the Binghamton Commission, did you take that as being in response to your previous expression of interest in an appointment? Yes. Right. And why did you want to have an appointment? I think it's just an honor. And prior to uh, this conversation with Charles Duncan, uh, I believe the records show that you had given somewhere over $170,000 to the DNC. Is that correct? No, I don't have the paper. Uh, let me look at it. That's about right. Okay, that's about right. Yes, sir. And why did you give over $170,000 to the DNC? That's such a contribution. You gave it as a contribution. It was a reason that you gave it to the DNC it's, versus, I mean, you're from Arkansas, uh, take a couple of Democrat senators, Democrat office holders from Arkansas or other Democrats that you would want to support. Is there a reason you gave it to the DNC versus a, a particular uh, candidate? Well, give the DNC most time is they, they have a function like a event, so it's a DNC, a DNC host the host the event, so that's a contribution have to go to DNC so you can attend the event. Uh, and some of those events were at the White House. Yes. Wait, wait yeah. a minute. Uh, can I correct that one? Certainly. Okay. 
Yes. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Did you, in your, and we won't mention the individual that you talked to, but uh, whenever you expressed your interest in appointment, did you describe what type of an appointment that you would like to have? No. It was just a general? Yes. Okay. And whenever Charles Duncan came back to you and said there might be an appointment to a Bingham and Commission, was that something you had interest in? No, I, in that time I didn't know. Well, I, I think that's what they involved the Asia, which you, that's why he think I would be, I might be helpful because I've been travel Asia. Most time when we have a, like a conversation or we have a dinner together, I, they always ask me Asian. I mean, how to do business with Asia, Asians. And what was the reason that you were meeting with Charles Duncan whenever he brought up the Bingham and Commission? No, I, if I'm, uh, I'm correct, was uh, he called me because most of the time when we have a dinner, we just talking. But one day, he, I, if I'm uh, correct, he called me to his office, mentioned to me there's a, a Benjamin commission because in that time I didn't know what would be the tar, uh, topic. I say yes, I'm interested uh, because it's uh, involving Asia. Was it? Uh, at what point did Mr. Duncan indicate to you that you were actually going to get this appointment? That will be after after the uh, FBI and the IRS. I uh, I submit uh, my paper to the IRS. I think it's next year, uh, somewhere around the early in '96. Yeah. And in fact. Uh, in 96, uh, Exhibit 145 uh, is an amendment to the executive order that expands the Beeman Commission uh, to a larger number. And uh, were you aware that they had to go to the extraordinary lengths of having an amendment to the executive order to expand it so that they could include you as an appointee? Can I look at the paper? Certainly. I don't know that. I do not know this one. Uh, no one told you that you no th one told they me. were having to expand the number on the commission? No one told me. Did you mention to Charles Duncan uh, the amount of your support for the Democratic Party? No. Uh, did you mention to anyone who was um, uh, uh, involved in that appointment, your support for the Democratic Party? No. Did you assume that they knew this? But I believe he's, he knew I was a, a, a present friend, long-time friend. You, you, and why do you say you thought he knew that you were the president's friend? They knew. He knew. But they knew that. That was obvious. Yes. Uh, but did you also assume that uh, Mr. Duncan knew of your contributions to the Democratic Party? I don't, I don't know he knew or not. I never mentioned to him. Uh, he, he, you didn't mention it, he didn't mention it, but did you assume that he knew? I don't have no idea. Now, You, in September of 95, while this appointment was hanging uh, or still uh, uh, in the works, uh, did you go to a uh, White House event for DNC contributors? What's the month? The month, it was September of 1995. Can I look the... Uh, well, if you wish, Exhibit 140 describes the list of the people who attended the event. That believe this is the event that you took Chong Lo with you. Oh, okay. I remember the Chong Lo. The... All right. And so you went to this event at the White House. Yes. And did you speak to the president at the event? I don't recall. Normally, if I say, 
before the last one, normally I tell, tell him, you look good. That's all I say. Do you remember speaking to anyone about your appointment to the Bingham Commission at this White House event? No. Now, When were you informed that you were going to be appointed to the commission? Well, I think you said that it was in January of 96. No, I didn't say the January, but the early part of 96. And who told you that you were going to get the appointment to the commission? I believe it was Charles Duncan. And uh, uh, what did he say when he talked to you? He said, you might have a chance to get into the appointee to the committee. And do you know who actually recommended you as an appointee? Excuse me? Do you know who, do you, do you believe that Charles Duncan was the one that was pushing your appointment? I don't know the process because, uh, oh, I know I, I send uh, all my information. Uh, I refer you to exhibit 144. And in this, do you, you have it before you? Yes. And the bottom half of that Exhibit 144 is what appears to be a memo from Phyllis Jones, who I understand is with the United States Trade Representative, uh, to Jennifer Hillman, uh, Thursday, September 21, 1995. The subject was the U.S. Pacific Commission. That's the Bingaman Commission. And in this memo, the reference is, well, I spoke with Charles Duncan uh, about Bingaman late Wednesday. Uh, here is the update. They have not bumped anyone off of our list. However, they want to add three people, a Senator Sarbanes person, and then it says a DNC nominee, and there's your name. Is that correct? Yes, that's my name. All right. And preceding your name on this memo is a designation DNC nominee. Yes. And uh, then later on, in the next paragraph, it says, Charles thinks, referring to Charles Duncan, thinks the best thing to do is to get the executive order amended so it can be increased. Uh, that, of course, has reference to expanding the commission so that you and two others could be added to it. Now, you're saying that you were never aware of the need to expand the commission. I never aware. Uh, now, but again, going back to the designation that you are the DNC nominee. Uh, uh, now, at this point in time, you had, well, at least prior to June of 95, you indicated you had given over $170,000 to the DNC. Is it fair to say that people who are involved in your appointment to the commission certainly knew of your uh, connection to and co contributions to the DNC? Well, you, your question is me, the, I know. The question is, no, uh, from this memo, is it clear to you that those who were involved in your appointment knew of your close connection to the DNC. Yeah, and this is a memo, yes. Did you ever discuss your appointment or potential appointment to the Bingaman Commission with anyone at the DNC? No. Did you ever discuss with anyone at the DNC your interest in an appointment in the administration? No. Now, you've mentioned some names previously that we're not going to mention. Yes. Uh, oh. They were not connected with the DNC? I connect with the DNC. Yes. But I don't believe he's DNC. Like me, I connect with the DNC, but I don't call myself a DNC. Okay. That's, that's, that's Certainly. The, you're a... That's, you're yeah, a, that's the way I look at things. Yeah. Okay, I, if you the question yes, what be yes? You are you are a supporter of the DNC. Yes. 
and you talked about your appointment to other supporters of the DNC. Yes, correct. All right. And uh, can you, I mean, you've given a significant amount of money, uh, uh, 100, over 170000 at that point and much more since then, uh, to the DNC. Who at the DNC or who associated with the DNC asked you to contribute to the DNC? In other words, who solicited these funds? You want to from the beginning of I uh, contribute? Is it a different one every time? Oh, yeah, because uh, the first one will be the Richard Mays. That's what uh, I believe that's what, yeah, that's what 100,000. And counsel, you tell me if I'm getting into the area, I'm not supposed to, but go ahead if you can't answer that. And the rest of the time is just DNC will send the, like events. So they, they fax you the event where how much will be, that's where this all the contribution comes, comes from. So people at the DNC who are organizing these events are soliciting you, as well as other individuals that are trying to Correct. raise the money. Yes. Do you know if anyone at the DNC ever contacted the White House about your appointment? No. Does that surprise you uh, whenever I showed you that exhibit uh, 144 that, that described you as a DNC nominee? Uh, does that surprise you in any way that you're yes, it surprised me. Now, I want to go to your uh, appointment to the commission. Did you ever hear that there was resistance to your appointment on the commission? No. Uh, Steve Clemens. that time. Uh, Steve Clemens, uh, a witness who worked for Senator Bingman, uh, told the committee that when he heard that you had been appointed to the commission, he had called you and talk to you. Do you recall that? No. You do not recall any conversation recall. with Steve Clemens? No. Or anyone with Senator Bingaman's office? I don't recall. And so if he indicated that uh, it was obvious to him, based upon his conversation with you, that you were not qualified, you would disagree with that? That's a, his opinion, maybe. Okay. And he, he further told the committee that uh, he had called Charles Duncan and objected to the fact that you were being placed on the commission uh, and that Duncan said that you were an absolute must appointment whose name had come from the highest levels of the administration. Uh, and were you aware of that? No. Did the Justice Department raise it in their questions to you? Maybe. I, I, I couldn't remember. Now, after you began serving on the commission, uh, you were a regular attender of the meetings? Yes. And uh, did you uh, follow everything that was all the business that was being conducted at the commission meetings? I try. And why do you say you tried? I, I am trying to make a business deal too in that time. I'm sorry, say that again. During the period of the serving the commission, I'm doing business too. So when the time, every time when they have a meeting, I, most time I attempt and we do everything as much as I can to, to learn. Uh, but w and when you're there, though, uh, did you f follow and did you understand what the commission was doing and uh, the issues, and did you communicate well with the other members of the commission? I think so. And did you ever have need of having anyone to assist you with the language in your meetings with the commission? Not the language. Assist about the to keep the record. Yes, there's a lady called Julie. She been help me.
but it was after several months later. Excuse me, Mr. Hutt. The gentleman's time has expired without objection. He'll be recognized for an additional 15 minutes. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Uh, did you feel like you were qualified to serve on the Bingaman Commission? I don't know. There's a limitation or what's a requirement. Are you asking me? No, I mean, I didn't know there's any requirement. You didn't know there were any requirements uh, for appointment to the commission. Uh, so no one, you were not aware of any particular qualifications? No. Did Charles Duncan interview about your qualifications for the commission? Yeah, we talk. He wanted to know, he wanted to know some people know Asia, which I do. I do better than anybody else in the commission. Uh, I want to go to one of the uh, meetings. Uh, Exhibit 154 is a transcript from the commission meeting held on June 12, 1996. And during that meeting, you made a lengthy statement about U.S.-Chinese relations. I believe that's correct. And in that statement, is it true that you indicated that you thought that we should find some way to work with China because they will eventually dominate all of Asia? Can I look at it? Certainly. Yes, yeah, that's what my opinion. So that was an opinion that you told the commission? Yes, potentially. And did you also tell the commission that you believe the Tiananmen Square massacre was justified? I don't understand the words. I'm sorry, what? I don't understand the words, just... Okay, uh, did you uh, tell the commission that you believe the Tiananmen Square uh, arrest and oppression of the dissident students was correct? Well, that's my own opinion. That is your opinion? Yes. And did you share that with the commission? And it might not, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't know that you did. I believe you shared that in some of your interviews. That is your opinion, though. But not, I, I don't believe that's in the commission meeting. F fair enough. And I, I'm not trying to let you know that I believe you did. I think you indicated that in some of your interviews that that was your view. Uh, but you're, I mean, you don't hide that view. Uh, you, you're very honest in expressing that view to anyone who talks to you about your view of China. Uh, if people would be, if people talk about what I feel about China, I address what I might feel. You tell them what you feel. Yes. Just like you told me that you believe the Tiananmen Square massacre or the Tiananmen Square oppression and the way the government handled it was correct, you would tell that to anybody who asked you your feelings on it. I would say that. And in your discussions with Charles Duncan about your views on China, did you share that view with him? Never. We never discussed this thing. Uh, in her interview, Ms. Wu Cummings uh, told the committee that you said you didn't feel like you could speak in front of the commission and you thought about dropping out of the commission. You, is that true? Well, it's true. Also, my, my time was a very, I have to, most time I have to do business in Asia, I have to fly back and forth. It's very tiresome, yes. And did you ever consider quitting the commission? Yes, I believe so, yes. Okay. And uh, it, one of the reasons that uh, you had someone to assist you with your commission duties is to help you with your understanding of what was happening in the commission. Yes. And to help you with the English and the different... Not, not only that, because the document is a whole bunch of documents every time. Okay. And did anyone... Any other members of the commission expressed to you 
their concern about your appointment? No. Uh, let me just uh, conclude, uh, Ms. Tree, with uh, just to let you know a little bit of where I'm coming from on this, that uh, you're a, an American citizen, you're an Arkansas resident, and uh, you wanted to be engaged in the political process, which you have an absolute right to do, and we ought to encourage everyone to do so. You gave a lot of money to uh, uh, the Democratic National Committee, and you sought involvement, which again, there's nothing wrong for that. I think that you have to wonder about the connection and whether the influence of money had something to do with an appointment of someone who really didn't feel comfortable to the point that you've wondered whether you should resign from the commission. And I think that that is a, an area of, of legitimate uh, governmental concern. But with mm -hmm. that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to turn back uh, and yield back my time. Thank the gentleman. He yields back the balance of his time. The chair will now recognize himself for a, a period of time. Uh, Mr. Tree, I want to uh, uh, chat with you about the, uh, the Lippo group, uh, Mr. Riotti and Mr. Wong. We had the, uh, the opportunity to have John Wong before the committee in late December of, of last year. Uh, and like you, he uh, acknowledged making conduit uh, contributions to the Democratic National Party. His were prior to the 1996 presidential election. Uh, and I asked him, and I, just so that I set it up in, in context, it occurred to me that he was essentially the, the man to see in the United States when the Riottis wanted to make a, a political contribution to a political figure uh, or party. Uh, in the United States uh, prior to 1996, when he then went to work for the, uh, the Commerce uh, Department and then the DNC, he stopped being that, and it occurs to me that based upon what the records in front of us that I'm going to go over with you, that you then became that person. Uh, that when the uh, can individuals can you speak at the... a little bit slowly? Sure. I cannot catch up. In, in 1996, for the 1996 election, uh, the pattern of your giving changed. The pattern of Mr. Wong's giving changed, and it now occurs that you, in 1996, became the conduit contributor. Uh, in other words, if the Riottis or the Lippo folks wanted to make a contribution, they came and gave the money to you. Uh, and that's the context in which I'm going to ask you a series of questions. And for you and your counsel's um, uh, convenience, I'm going to focus on exhibits 251 to 258 during the course of my questioning to you. I, I want to begin with, uh, first of all, if you could uh, describe for the committee and tell us when you first met John Wong and uh, under what circumstances. That was in 1994. And, and I, I think it will be in the uh, Capache uh, meeting. Sometime we have a meeting, he show up. We're just uh, talking, you know, about the uh, Asian Americans, uh, uh, Capache's uh, agenda. APEC, APEC, APEC. No, 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 not APEC. It's a uh, Capache. Okay. Then, so I believe he gave me the business card. Then I met him two times in his office, two or three times. But uh, I believe the first time I by myself. I think one time I think I bring uh, Antonio Pan with me because Antonio Pan know him when they were in Little Rock. Well, but, but that goes to my question. You, you indicated in your 302s you met Mr. Wong in 1994, and that would indicate to me that you did not know him when he worked in Little Rock and you had no contact or no meeting with him that you remembered prior no, yeah, to 1994. No, no. Uh, you were aware that Mr. Wong was uh, taken in and hired by the Commerce Department, were you not? Did you know that John Wong worked for the United States uh, yes, Department yes. of Commerce? Did yes. you have the opportunity to visit with him when he was at the Commerce Department? Yes. On how many occasions? Two or three times. And during the time that you would have visited with him um, while he was at Commerce, did you discuss with him any issues of trade? No, I just didn't know him. Well, what was the purpose of your meetings with him when you were at uh, Commerce? Oh, just ask him how I do, should I do business in Asia, so, something, just ask him the, his uh, opinion and knowing him. Okay. Did you ever discuss? Uh, or were you ever invited to any of the political events that you eventually made contributions for uh, with Mr. Wong when he worked at Commerce? Not that I recall. Did you ever discuss with Mr. Wong the Lippo Group and his former work with, and employment with the Lippo Group? No, because I don't Commerce? know Lippo. Okay. I mean, I know Lippo, but I don't know the uh, people well, higher, well, higher in the family. 
then you didn't know, or are you saying you don't know him now? Oh, I know them now. Right, but you didn't know him in 1994. Uh, yeah. All right. When did you learn that John Wong was leaving the, the Department of Commerce and going to work for the, for the DNC? I couldn't remember. All right, you, you don't remember year, yeah. month, or anything? No. But you became aware of that fact? Yeah, well, he in the Commer I mean, DNC, I think he, we talk, you know. But I couldn't remember the date. Did, did John Wong, when he moved from Commerce to the DNC, ask you to raise money for the Democratic National Committee? Can you ask a question? Okay. When John Wong went to work for the Democratic National Committee, did he call you and ask you to raise money for the Democratic National Committee? Yes. Do you recall when that was? I couldn't recall the time. Was John Wong the only one from the Democratic National Committee calling and asking you to raise money, or were there others also calling you about the same time? Because I think he was the one handle it. Because uh, he he always tell me, you know, we should put the uh, Asians uh, put an event for Asians. That's what I, you know, that's why I fought real hard. Otherwise, just just because they have an event, they fax to me the event. I call them, so I want a attempt, you know, so I will know. I want to talk a little bit about, if I can, about your personal history of giving and how, at least to me, the records show that it changed in 1996. In 1994, you gave almost $150,000 to the Democratic National Committee. Would you agree with me that that's a pretty accurate figure? Yeah, but right. And in 1995, you gave over $50,000. But right. But you don't have a history, at least on any of the Democratic National Committee tracking forms, of being a large... Um, an individual who went out and did a lot of soliciting. You gave a lot of money, but you weren't soliciting a lot of contributions from other people prior to 1996. Isn't that correct? Mm, correct. Okay. Well, wh why did that change? Why were you content with being a, a big supporter and giving your money to the Democratic National Committee before 1996, and then in 1996, all of a sudden, you become a fundraiser? You go out and solicit. What, who asked you to do that, or why did you decide to do that? Oh, because we have the record, so the uh, Democratic National Committee uh, uh, gave us a, I have a, I have to see the paper, uh, the title of, uh, uh, as chair for the, Yeah, uh, I was a, uh, Title was some uh, something like a uh, vice chair for the uh, DNC Finance Committee. And, and did you get that title, of vice chair of the Democratic National Committee, in 1996? I'm, I don't recall when. Maybe 95. But in the 1996, of, for us, I remember it's uh, because it's uh, getting to elections, so it's more involvement on the fundraising. That's why we've been. And uh, if you look at the record, most of the fundraising under 1996 will be under Hey Adam, Hey Adam, that event. That's including $325,000 I raised from the Gandhi. Uh, I, I, I don't know, I forgot his first name. Right. Well, uh, but going back to this vice chair of the Democratic National Committee, is, is that something that you sought, uh, or is that something that someone asked you to assume? I believe I saw on the uh, facts paper. But I don't have the paper now. No, no, no. I, I'm saying, is that a job you wanted and you asked for, or is that a job someone asked you to take? No, no. They just uh, say how much money you've been raised. You know, I think it's hundred thousand. Will it will be? I don't even remember the time, but I I remember I see the paper. Yeah, but but I guess I'm maybe we're talking past each other. How did you become a vice chair of the Democratic National Committee? How did that happen? Just so by giving they, a I think they select uh, select people. Yeah, well, who selected? Who told you that you were vice chair of the Democratic I believe National I see the facts. I don't remember who told me, but I see the facts. So, so one day, you you see a, a piece of paper that all of a sudden, boom, you're a you're a vice chairman of finance for the Democratic National Committee. Mm -hmm. Do you know? I mean, it, it just showed up like a. You know, an unsolicited. Yeah, because uh, I believe it's how, uh, how much money you raise, you will get it. So that okay. Well, that's it. And so it's it's sort of like a membership that if you raise a hundred thousand yeah, dollars, you yeah, become yeah, a vice yeah, chair. Yeah, and yeah. What, if you raise a million dollars, you become the chairman. And what? It, yeah, that, that I, the way I don't think you will never become chairman. I wouldn't think so. I wouldn't think so. Okay. Well.
uh, going to exhibit number 251. That that's a, a it's a, a seven-page exhibit, and if I could, or maybe more, but I want to direct your attention to uh, the seventh page. It's an article from the Washington Post, dated November the third. 1995, and it talks about the soft money contributors to the Democratic National Committee, uh, and uh, Dahutsu, Dahetsu, Dahatsu, excuse me, uh, is listed uh, as one of the largest uh, soft money contributors uh, to the Democratic National Committee in the United States in that article. Uh, do you recall uh, being a part of such contributions in 1995? 1995, yeah. Yes. Okay. And after that article ran in, in 1995, that identified that contribution or that level of contribution to the DNC. Did that article or the fact that it was now public cause you any concern? I couldn't recall. I couldn't recall see this article. Okay. Well, after the article was in the newspaper, did anyone contact you expressing concern about the fact that your firm was listed as one of the largest soft money contributors to the I Democratic couldn't recall National that. Committee? Do you recall anyone at the Democratic National Committee telling you to stop making uh, large individual contributions and no. instead begin to solicit? If you could just wait till I finish, and I'll tell, then you can tell me no, uh, and uh, uh, and begin to focus on other individuals to make contributions other than yourself. No. Richard Sullivan, you know who Richard Sullivan is. Yes, I do. Uh, Richard Sullivan testified and, uh, and indicated to the Senate that in 1994 and 1995 he asked you to raise money for the Democratic National Committee but that you refused, other than making your own uh, contributions. Do you recall that conversation? I don't recall that. Did uh, Mr. Wong, John Wong, who was also a vice chair of finance uh, over at the, uh, the DNC, if I understood him correctly, when he was here in December, did you recall any conversations with him that they needed hard money, that they needed to raise hard money for the DNC, and that you should try and raise smaller contributions rather than the larger soft money contributions? No. Did John Wong ever encourage, you've acknowledged making conduit contributions. No. You know? you, 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 well, you have, haven't you? Yeah, that's okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay, can you? Sure. I, you have acknowledged making a number of conduit contributions. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and just so that, that we're talking about the same thing, I know your lawyers know what I'm saying, but what it, that is that a contribution comes from someone else to you when you make it in a name other than the name of the donor or in an improper way. Is that a fair observation? People would give you money and you'd make a donation, but it wasn't your dough. Maybe the opposite, opposite way. You'd give, think... you'd give people money to make in their names and it yes. was your money that's yes. okay. All right, yes. so, so you, were the, you were the money man in the conduit contributions that were made uh, as opposed to the, the person in whose name they were given. Is that right? Yeah, that's what I plead guilty to it, yes. Okay. Did, did uh, John Wong ever have any discussions with you about the what a conduit contribution was? No. Did he ever discuss with you what the fundraising rules were? And no. specifically, the conduit contributions were not proper? No. And I believe if we, we get your testimony today, you didn't know that that was wrong? Correct. But no, I, I didn't know. What? what? You have to give the same question, maybe. That's okay, Nigel. It, it's, no, you didn't know that that was wrong? No, I know it's wrong, but it's an, I didn't know it's illegal. Okay. Well, maybe I, 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 I didn't think know I, the, uh, I think no. I did. I did hear you say that a little earlier, and that puzzles me, because if it's wrong, I mean, what would be wrong about it if it isn't illegal? Do you know what I mean? I, I guess what, you're making a distinction, I guess, without a difference to me. Wrong because you're not supposed to do it, uh, or wrong, I mean, if, if it's wrong, it's also against the law is wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, I didn't know the election law until I talked to, uh, I have I have uh, my lawyer since 19, late 1996. Okay. Then I know that's uh, uh, illegal, that's uh, the law. Okay, I, if, if you can just hang on to that thought, I want to yield to the uh, chairman yes, for the question. Yield, uh, sure. uh, did you ever talk to Don Fowler? Yeah, I talked to Don Fowler. Did you ever talk to Mr. Sullivan? Yes, I do. When you were talking to them, did you ever talk to them about contributions? Yeah, we do talk about contribution. Well, you know, they knew the law. 
uh, Mr. Fowler was the head of the DNC and Mr. Sullivan was one of the leaders over there. Mm -hmm. When you talk to them about contributions and these large contributions, didn't they ever question you about where you were getting the money or? No. They never asked the no, question? No, I never, I have never recall. Did, uh, did they ever, uh, did you ever talk to them about uh, people that you were giving the money to who were gonna give money to the DNC? No, they don't ask. They didn't ask? Yeah. How many times did you talk to Mr. Fowler? Not many times. One time? No, more than that. Twenty times? No. Ten I, times? I couldn't, I couldn't tell you the exact time. But many times? Yeah, several times. And how many times did you talk to Mr. Sullivan? Not many times. Five, six times. Five or six times? And, and, and when you talk to them about contributions, no, they just tell me to raise money. But you were one of the uh, vice uh, chairman, right? Yeah. I, mean, I think just, they have just, many, it, many of the uh, vice chairmen. Mr. Mr. Tree, it just seems so difficult to understand. You're, you were picked along with John Wong to be very important people at the DNC. You were raising hundreds of thousands of dollars. And you talked to Fowler and you talked to Sullivan and nobody ever questioned whether or not these contributions were conduit contributions or how they were coming in or anything else. He just took the money and ran, right? That's, uh, that's what happens. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I, I, just getting back to uh, that vice chairmanship that you apparently were notified with a piece of paper or a fax. I mean, did it come with a starter kit? You know, sort of like, congratulations, you're now a vice chairman of the DNC. Here are the rules. Nobody ever explained any rules to you? No. How about the, the rule that John Wong ever sit down with you and talk about the fact that the federal government is in the practice of monitoring cash transactions of greater than $10,000? Was that within your knowledge in 1996? I don't think so. Going, getting back to, to, to where I left off before I yielded to the chairman, this, this concept of wrong is, is troubling me, I guess. And Now, are, are you telling me that, that uh, you knew that there was something not right about you taking money and giving it to somebody else and having that somebody else donate money in their name to the DNC, the President of the United States, whatever the, the candidate of your, you knew that was not an appropriate thing to do. Correct. It, okay. Well, if you, I, I guess if you didn't know it was a violation of the law, and I understand lawyers and, and the lawyers told you that it was a violation of the, of the, the elections law and might have shown you the section and, and things of that nature, but, but what, did you, what rule did you think you were breaking? Uh, by making or participating in a conduit contribution if it wasn't a law of the United States of America? I mean, do you think it was one of the Ten Commandments, or what? What's that? Well, what was wrong about it? If, if it wasn't illegal, I... Maybe I, ten... I mean... Well, I, what, what's wrong? I didn't know. But you... Well, okay, I, uh, and I got that. But, but yeah. you, you knew it was wrong when you were doing it. What is something wrong? That's what I, I put on the statement. Is uh, I don't feel comfortable. Okay. Well, well, are you now saying that you didn't know it was wrong? You just did, you felt a little squeamish about it. Right. I, I, I'll come back to that in a minute. When when Wong was working at the DNC and apparently okay. a vice chair as you were. Did he ever discuss with uh, you the, the money that he was raising from Ted Siong and his family? Did you ever have a conversation with him about Ted Siong and his family? No, I, we met in the uh, uh, fundraising event. We just shake hands and say, what do you do, what do we do, that's all I know. Uh, but, but specifically, did you have a conversation with John Wong? Did he discuss, no, no, Mr. No. Wong discuss with you the money he was raising for, with, from Ted Siong and his family? No. And, and similarly to the same question about the weird anadas, did you ever have a conversation with uh, with uh, John Wong about the money that he was soliciting and raising from the Weir Donata family. What's the, uh, the name? Weir Donata. W-I-R-I-A-D-I-N-A. -I -I -A -A. Oh, I, I don't know. I don't know those people. Okay. During the time that he was at the Democratic National Committee, and, and apparently you were too, did you ever discuss uh, with John Wong his relationship with the Riotti family? No. Can, can I address on the vice chair? John Wong and me is a total different thing. <coughs> I think he's uh, walking there. We are not, which is uh, something, a title. So it's a total different thing to 
he will, uh, 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 for, if I put it this way, he will get a pay in the DNC, right. but I, right. I, I he, won't. Right, he was getting paid and you were doing the paying, is that, but, but for whatever the case may be, you both were vice chairs of finance, apparently, of the, uh, of the Democratic National Committee. Did you ever provide any money to John Wong? Did you ever give him any money? And, and specifically, so you don't think it's a trick, there's a, the next exhibit is exhibit number 252, uh, dated June the 26th, yeah, 1775 okay. dollars. And, that, and, that and what was what was that check for? I couldn't recall. You don't know. Yeah. Okay. Seven. Uh, one. Th the exhibit's 1,775 dollars, right? That that's 1,775 dollars. That's a check drawn on your company for 1,775 yes, dollars yes. to John Wong. But, but you, I cannot recall you have the, no knowledge of uh, the purpose. Okay. Can we take a break? I want to try to go to the restroom. Uh, yes, if you want to go to the restroom, uh, we, we're, we're trying to accommodate legal counsel and everybody to uh, adjourn or finish up by 6 o'clock. So, uh, I'll yes. be real quick. Okay, take your time. We stand in recess for Mr. Tree. We'll be back in just a moment. We're recessing for Mr. Tree to uh, go to the restroom, and it shouldn't over five minutes, I wouldn't think. We will resume questioning with the irrepressible Mr. La Tourette. Uh, just to finish on that check for $1,775, I, um, if, if I understand your, uh, uh, what it is you, you used to do for a living, you owned a restaurant in Little Rock, Arkansas. Is, it, is that right? For a number Good of years? Correct. How many years was that? Since 1978 until 1992. Okay. Uh, and it was a small operation, a small business? Yeah, I guess so. Oh, what, what do you think your best year was? I mean, in, in terms of uh, revenue from the Chinese restaurant? I believe it probably would be 1990. I'm sorry? 1990, 91. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking in dollars, though. I mean, what, what's, the, what's the most money I, you think you I, I never to the county, my, my wife is the one to all the, she's a cashier and the bartender. Okay. The, the point I'm trying to get at, that $1,775 seems like a lot of money to me. I mean, if I, if I wrote a $1,775 check to somebody, it, it would hurt. Uh, and, but you still are telling me you don't know why you wrote a $1,775 check to John Wong in 1996, four years after you're out of the Chinese restaurant business. I just couldn't remember. Okay. Uh, when did you first meet uh, James Riotti? You mean met or see James oh, Riotti? I, I mean meet him, like meet be, him. be introduced uh, to him. The introduced was, in, I believe, in 1996 in one event in L.A. Okay. And, and so again, that answer, just like when I was talking to you about John Wong, you never had the opportunity to meet with James Riotti or meet him in Arkansas when you were both no, in Little no, Rock, Arkansas. No. Excuse me, the gentleman yield real quickly. Surely. Uh, James Riotti worked at the Worthen Bank in Little Rock. Yes. And uh, you're, you're saying that you did not know him at all? I when, know him, but I never met him. Well, you knew him, but... I he, knew him, yes. Had he eaten in your restaurant? I don't think so. I don't recall. But he loaned me the money. He loaned not you... Not him loaned me the money. Worthen Bank loaned me the money after they uh, joined with the Worthen Bank. But you had never met him personally? No. Thank you, gentlemen.
Uh, you're welcome, Mr. Chairman. So, so 1996 at an event in Los Angeles is yes. when you believe you were introduced to him formally and met him, although you may have seen him yes. at other occasions, and his financial institution may have provided you with some loans for to do some things that you were doing. Is that right? I didn't get a last part. I thought in response to the chairman's question that he gave you the money, you got some money from the Lippo Bank, no? No, not Lippo Bank, it's from the Wharton Bank. From the Wharton Bank. Yes. Okay. Uh, you, did you have the opportunity to see him in 1993 at an APEC meeting in Jakarta? Yes. Okay, but again, that's seeing him, you weren't introduced to him, you didn't meet no. him. Witnesses who were at that meeting indicated that you greeted him like he was an old friend of yours. So apparently he wasn't an old friend of yours in 1993 no. because you hadn't met him yet. No, I, I did not. Okay. Did you have a discussion with Mr. Riotti at all uh, in 1993 at the APEC meeting uh, in Jakarta? No, I don't recall at all. Uh, I want to go now to an event that occurred on September the 26th of 1996. It was a, a fundraising event for the Democratic National Committee. It was conducted at the Washington, D.C. Sheraton Carlton. Uh, and it, if it assists you at all, it was an event that was primarily organized uh, by uh, David Mercer and was intended to, uh, uh, as most of its invitees, uh, be members of the African-American community. Do you recall that event at all? No. Can I look at the... Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, which page? Oh, there, there is no specific exhibit. I'm talking at the moment about a, 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 a fundraising event at the uh, D.C. Sheraton Carlton. And, it, and, I and, I, and just, just so I'm not, uh, not going uh, to attempt to follow you up or trick you, when John Wong was here, he indicated that he went with you to this particular event. And following that event, he and James Riotti both spent the evening uh, at, your, uh, at your apartment at the Watergate. Do you recall such a, a series of events? I couldn't recall that one. In Sheraton, let me s The Sheraton Carlton Hotel in Washington, D.C. in September of 1996. I, I, I don't remember that one. Well, specifically, and, and then maybe we can wa work through some of the exhibits and get there from here. If, if you want to look at uh, exhibit number 253, I believe, we'll start there. That's a receipt from the Cary Limousine Company. And again, Mr. Wong, when he was here, indicated that he uh, retained the limousine for the purpose of going out to the Dulles Airport, I believe, and picking up Mr. Riotti. And then they were joined by you, and you all traveled to the Sheraton Carlton or a fundraising event organized by David Mercer. And at the conclusion of that event, you came back and all of you spent the night at the Watergate. Watergate only have a two bedroom. I don't believe I was uh, with them. Okay, Especially well, you talk about the well, limousine. I don't remember that. All right, well, well, forget the sleeping arrangements for a minute. Are you telling me that you don't know you, you do. You have no knowledge of being at a fundraising event for the Democratic National Committee on September the 26, 1996. That one I don't. I don't remember. I By the way, uh, on the question I forgot who was asking, that day was uh, uh, so. Uh, somebody was asking to extend uh, to Octo October. This is the one they made, right? September. The Phone calls, telephone call to right. Indonesia, to Timuria, to some right. people. Right, that's the same day, and I. No, I, that day. So we are to talking about a different thing. Jiang Huang's stay in my house will be the late October, so that phone call, not this one. Okay. The, All right. Well, well, since you don't remember that that particular series of events, Mr. Wang remembers them, but I don't. Okay. Understand. I mean, I do, you're not required to remember everything. I, I want to turn to a document that the FBI took from your office, uh, which is another exhibit. Uh, and it's exhibit number 255. And exhibit number 255 is a translation of a document, again, that was taken from your office. And if you could take a minute and study it, and, and uh, if you would be so kind as to tell the committee who drafted that document. So your question is on this uh, letter? I, I, I want to know who wrote that. I, I don't know. I don't think it's me. 
Uh, do you have any idea how it wound up in your office then? And it was taken by the FBI? No, probably when they stay in my apartment, they wrote something. Maybe a memo or something. I don't well, believe it's me. Well, let's, let's go through the translation if we could, and maybe some of it will come back to you. The first paragraph refers to opening a Walmart in Shanghai. Did you ever have any discussions with anyone at the Lippo organization about opening up a Walmart store in Shanghai? No. Were you involved in any business ventures between Walmart and Lippo? No. The second paragraph talks about buying and modernizing a hospital in Shanghai. Did you ever discuss such a venture with anyone at the Lippo organization? No. No? If, no, no, no. The fourth if, uh, item... The fourth item discusses purchasing a hotel in San Francisco. I do remember this one. This one is, uh, I, I, now if I try to recall, my, I'm thinking this uh, whole thing, maybe Antonio Pan is right, wrote. So, maybe Antonio Pan wrote the whole thing. Okay, so, so in response to my, my earlier question about who drafted the document, you now believe that Antonio Pan is the because author? Because I recall the fourth part, the hotel, because I remember some people told me the hotel is very small. In San Francisco, it's only $7 million. Because in the San Francisco, $7 million cannot buy a big hotel. So I remember this one. Okay. Somebody was mentioned to me, this is a hotel. So, so just so I'm clear, so I don't miss the opportunity to, to uh, have the benefit of your refreshed memory, you, you still don't remember anything about the Walmart? No, I cannot or, remember. Or the other questions. But number four, the hotel in San Francisco yes, uh, rings number a bell. Four. Even the number five, I might be very uh, uh, understand this one because uh, that's the L.A. Bank. It's right. Mr. Well, that, that's the next part, right? Right, right, LA right. Bank. Well, that, that item four in the San Francisco Hotel indicates that it rec the document recommends finding six Chinese investors to put in $1 million each, uh, and uh, it states that they can use that to then request immigration. Did, did you ever discuss the San Francisco Hotel uh, venture with anyone uh, in the Riotti family or in the Lippo organization? No. Did you ever discuss it with Antonio Pan? I think Antonio Pan asked me, so I remember this. Well, when you say that he asked you, was Antonio Pan asking if you wanted to be one of the six investors at a million dollars apiece? No, I'm not, uh, just uh, maybe lo locate. Locate six investors, yeah, yeah. six Chinese investors? Yes. Okay. Uh, who, uh, who is the document referring to? If you go a little further down in the document, um, it, it talks about an individual by the name of Wang Jun. You see that? Specifically, it, it says that Wang Jun buy the Lippo bank stocks with money as reinforcement to enter the U.S. market. Did you see that uh, portion of the document? Yeah, more likely I look at the whole thing. Should be Antonio Pan drive for the whole thing. I, I'm just asking if you see, I want to ask you some questions about that portion of the document. I'm asking mm -hmm. if you see that portion of the document so okay. I can ask you a question. We all set? Yeah. Okay. Who, who is Wang Jun, first of all? Wang Jun is uh, uh, chairman of the CITIC of Chinese Corporation. And, and, and you know him and knew him back in, at this time period, it's not 1996? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. well, the document refers to, uh, it says, knowing you have good relations with Wang Jun. Correct. Did you have good relations with Wang uh, Jun? Yes. It, is that referring to you? Yeah, you, me. You was yeah, you, yes. right. Okay, I but, mean, it should be me. Okay. Because I brought one gin to the White House coffee. All right. But the, the document, again, we're still talking about the San Francisco Hotel, and it says the L.A. bank stocks. The document says that maybe a part of the L.A. bank stock can be sold to Wang Jun. The L.A. bank is, uh, what? first of all, what, what L.A. bank is the document referring to? I believe it's Mr. Ye's uh, bank. Mr. Who's bank? Yeah. 
but it indicates that, uh, it goes on to say, knowing that you have good relations with Wang Jun, and so the document's referring to you, you believe? You're mm, the one I, with the I good relations? Yes. The document also indicates proposing that Wang Zhu buy the Lippo bank stocks with money as reinforcement to enter the U.S. market, and, and so forth and so on. He knows that you have good relations with China. Do you yes. Think? And, and does that also refer to you? I believe so, yes. So Mr. Pan, in writing that document, is, is expressing the view that you have good relations with China? Yes. Okay. Were you proposing a, a way for, were you attempting to find a way for Wang Jun to enter the United States, the United States market? Is that what this was about? Oh, this is just, a, for my look, it's just a business potential. Because well, there's a bank of wonderful sale. So, you know, if one you have money, can he buy this bank? Well, that, that's exactly what it is. And now, yes. Did you ever discuss this proposal with Wang Jun? No. Are you aware of any relationship between James Riotti and Wang Jun? No, because uh, Mr. Antonio Pan worked for me. He used to work for Jim Riyadi, and he probably, uh, he know Wang Jun because when Wang Jun come to here, but he had, uh, he don't have a chance to talk to Wang Jun, so he let me know the business of plan, that's all. Well, well, and so this, this was something that had no, I mean, another than the conversation with Antonio Penn saying that, hey, here's something that's going on. Uh, Would you do it? He asked you to do it. Yeah, maybe. But you, just but you didn't do it. No, 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 this never happened. Okay, and, and again, just to finish this document, and then I'll, I'll be done with this series of questions. The last two paragraphs talk about the possibility of follow-up meetings with Riyadi and John Wong uh, about these proposals. To your knowledge, did any of those meetings take place? Any meetings between James Riyadi and John Wong concerning the proposals in, in the exhibit in front of you, 250, whatever it is? I think this is just a Mr. Uh, Antonio Pan was uh, making some deal, want to try me to follow up. Have, have we, I never had, went to New York with Jiang Huang. I mean, uh, Jiang Huang in New York on October 10th. So we never have a meeting with him. You never had a meeting with him? Yeah, we never have a meeting with Jiang Huang in New York okay. on October the 10th. I think the whole thing is just a, a planning, business planning. Now, obviously, your name has appeared in a number of newspaper articles concerning the, the campaign fundraising scandal surrounding the 1996 presidential <laughs> campaign. Have you had any conversations with James Riotti uh, concerning any of the articles? Uh, no. Have you had any conversation with him concerning your involvement in the campaign fin fundraising scandal? No, he don't, he don't know much about me. Have you received any money from James Riotti or anyone affiliated with the Lippo Group uh, that either did or didn't make its way into the hands of the Democratic National Committee? I received uh, one of the... Uh, wire money from uh, on the 1990, I think 1994, from uh, what's the name? Lucky Port. A Lucky Port. But I couldn't recall. Uh, other than that, other than that uh, no. recollection by you, no other funds no, from James no, Riotti or no. the Lippo Group? No. And, and, and just to, then to close, and, and I appreciate your patience. Um, this whole notion of conduit contributions, just to, to go back to that for a minute. If, and, and maybe it's a difference without a distinction, and, and maybe it's a, a level of understanding that you have that I don't have. If you, if there was nothing wrong with you giving money to the Democratic National Committee in your own right, in other words, if you had $100,000 burning a hole in your pocket and you wanted to see it get into the hands of the Democratic National Committee, why did you feel it was necessary to break it up and give it to other people uh, so that when the authorities who were in charge with policing our, our federal uh, fine, uh, campaign laws looked at the report, they wouldn't see $100,000 from Charlie Tree. They'd see $10,000 from Charlie Tree, $10,000 from this person, $10,000. Why, why would you feel compelled to do that if you didn't know it was against the laws of the United States of America? Oh, because only because I, I think in that time, I, my bank account doesn't have that much money. Because because your bank account doesn't My have enough account, money to cover yeah. the amount of contributions that yes, are being made. Yes, sometimes if uh, five six people come in, I cannot write that much check. Yeah, yeah, but that, I, I guess now this causes me a bigger problem, and I, sorry, Mr. Chairman, but earlier when I asked you about conduit contributions, you said that uh, there's two ways that conduit contributions can go. You can either be the money man or or sort of the the middleman, the bag man, and I I understood you to say that you were the man with the money. 
that gave money to other people to give to the Democrats. Is, isn't that the way this worked, as opposed to... Yes. Okay, well then, then what do you mean you didn't have enough money in your bank account? Because you not only had enough money to cover yours, you were giving money to other people to give. So it, your answer doesn't even make any sense to me. It's a friend of my Mr. Wu provided the money. Okay, well, well, so you're not the man with the money. You're, you're the middle guy. Somebody, somebody gave you money, and then you took somebody else's money and gave it to a bunch of other people, and they donated. Is that right? I mean, I, I really, I just want to know what you were doing. If, if you, I, I'd be happy to have you explain it, and I don't have any objection to that as long as your client then affirms your explanation, since he's the one under oath. Then. Talking about two separate... We're, we're, we're breaking with uh, oh, I'm sorry. normal tradition, but that's... Go ahead. We're talking about two separate categories. Put the mic... Uh, would you ha hold the mic uh, there, Counselor? Thank you. We're talking about two separate kinds of conduct. Mr. Wu sent money into the United States. Mr. Tree has testified here and elsewhere that he believed that to be common money and that he was able to make contributions as he saw fit because it was pursuant to a common goal with Mr. Wu. Mr. Tree has testified repeatedly that in his mind that was not illegal. Second category, category of conduct is subsequent, mostly in 1996, there were conduit contributions wherein he would approach people, sometimes friends, sometimes families, and he would prevail upon those people to make contributions, and later he would reimburse those people. So we had both categories of conduit contributions from some person's eyes. It's that second category that he pled guilty to. Okay. That, and is, is that your understanding, Mr. Tree? That, that's yes. what you think is? Yes. That's the straight skinny? Okay. Uh, on that second category, though, uh, is it, are you telling the committee that the reason that you operated that way is because you couldn't, you wanted to make sure that at a certain fundraising event, the President of the United States and his party had 100,000 bucks, you didn't have 100,000 bucks, and so, a, a you know, friend, will you front the money, I'll pay you back later? Oh, because there's nothing wrong with that, right? Okay, you have to know, uh, I, I'll let you know the uh, circumstance at that time. Huh? Sometime when the, uh, uh, when we see the event, just like the, uh, what's it? The event, hey, Adam, there's more money have to come in, but I didn't have the money in there, so Mr. Wu haven't come in yet. So I cannot write a check to people, so I tell people to write a check. And then so I can reimburse when he come in and have the cash. But my bank account doesn't have the money. Right, but, but you, you then paid them back when you, when you received it. Yes. Money. But, but uh, and is it your testimony that the reason that you went through that is because you didn't have the money to cover it at the time and you've had no interest in, I mean, you, you knew from these fundraising events. I mean, you've been giving money to the Democrats for a very long period of time. You know that when you go to an event, you have to fill out who you are, where you live, you know, that, that you work at a certain place so that we can keep track of that or that the federal government can keep track of that. Uh, but you knew under this scheme that you had going on that when we check the records for an event at the Hay Adams or anything else, we'd see a lot of names with people whose money wasn't even their money that was being given to the Democratic National Committee, right? You knew that. And that's why you thought it was wrong, yes. And yes. And you knew that was wrong. was wrong. Yes. The only thing that you, you haven't been willing to tell us, despite the fact that you apparently have immunity, is that wrong doesn't equal illegal to you. It just, it's just, it's some some wrong out there in the, 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 the uh, Okay, if uh, if I put it this way, like uh, wrong, you make a, a, a U-turn, but the law is different. Right, so you, you're telling us that... I don't think it's also, I don't know the election law until yeah. the campaign finance block of I find out this FEC. Okay, so, so you, you would have everyone that, that is interested in this, that these are errors of judgment, but certainly you didn't mean to break the laws of the United States, right? Is that, that right? Yes. Is that right? With an errors in judgment, you may be committed wrong. Am I correct in that statement, sir? 
I'm sorry, sir. Can you repeat? I don't think I can, but I'm going to give it a shot. I'm, are you saying that you're asking those of us that are interested that these were just errors in judgment, but certainly you had no intention at this time with these illegal or these conduit contributions of breaking any rules or laws? Yes, you, uh, you correct, this is the law. I, I know I'm correct, but I, I was going to your intent. That, that, I think I yes. beat that horse enough. Thank you, Mr. Let, let, let me just, uh, before I yield to, uh, did, did you, yeah, you want to ask questions? You want to yield to Mr. Horn first? Mr. Horn was uh, next. Have him go. Okay, go. okay. Before we yield to Mr. Horn, let me just say, uh, there were three pages of conduit contributions that we gave to you. Are you saying that all of those conduit contributions were because you didn't have enough money in the bank at that time? Every single one of them? Some of them is I didn't give them money for. I know, but, but, but are you saying all of the conduit contributions that you were involved in, all of them, were because you didn't have enough money in the bank at the time? Also, I just don't think my name is, I don't want to, I want to be low key. I don't want to, my name always uh, have $100,000 or something. You that's didn't want to have your name yeah, on it. Yeah, in my, in my. Okay, well, I think that's a very important point mm -hmm. because you have been leading us to believe that the reason these conduit payments took place was because you didn't have enough money in the bank. That's one and of you the reasons. But there were also a lot of conduit contributions that you made where you did have money and you didn't want your name on them, isn't that correct? That's, uh, that's a both of the reason in my mind. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Horn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Tree. Uh, my questioning will relate to the following premise here that between May of 1994 and November 1996, Ing Lap Singh wired $1,105,000 to you uh, or his companies. And uh, during that time, uh, Mr. Wu also brought in another $382,929 in cash and traveler's checks to the U.S. during his visits. But I want to stick with Mr. Ing Lap Singh, and I'd just like to go through some simple questions with you. Uh, when did you first meet uh, Ing Lap Singh? It's, uh, I think it's uh, 1994 or late 1993. And where was that? Uh, I met him in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong? Yes, airport. You, you were there on business? No, uh, somebody introduced me, so I went to look him. Uh, he was waiting for me. Uh, how did you happen to meet him in Hong Kong? Oh, you suggest uh, people already say he want to see me, so I went to Hong Kong from Beijing. So this was at his request? Oh, you said people introduced us. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. the lady introduced us uh, called Maria Han. When you first met him, did you know anything about his background at that no, point? No, no. Why did you go to Hong Kong and see him? What was the purpose? Money for the Democratic National Committee or money for a hotel? No, not even a hotel. It's just a friend introduced. I just go to see him. And uh, you just felt this was another business person you wanted to like or what? Yes, I just want to know him. Now, what was your relation with him over time, then, once you met him in Hong Kong? we become a real good friend, also a business partner. What uh, kind of a background did you find out that he did have? Oh, everything I have is from him to tell me. He said, in the late 1970s, somewhere around 76 or 77, he and his wife, I think, uh, swim to, from... Uh, Zhuhai to Macau. Then they stay in Macau. They sell, uh, they do the, they do everything. Then lately they do the textile. By late 1980s, the textile business went down. So they start doing the, uh, um, you know, the real estate business, which is uh, like a buy and a sell. And at that time, uh, I remember it's a, uh, real estate is a real downhill in Macau, Hong Kong, and, Asia, uh, and China. 
so he become involved in that business. But he, because he's, a, I think he's a very smart man, so he make a real good business. Then, 19, 1990s, I think 93, he involved a project called Nanvan Lake, which is in Macau. So I met when I met him, he's he said he needed some. Uh, investor from other country, special from if he can, uh, he doesn't speak English. So he said, if uh, you can help me uh, to help uh, look at the uh, people to help his uh, project. So we went to Macau to see the Naman Lake project. Also when we come back here to US, I, I remember I brought some of the brochure of the, his uh, project. Wait, I know him. Do you know what year he arrived in Macau? Uh, was it uh, about a year before you met him, or how long had he been there? Uh, 76, somewhere, 76, 77, 76. yes. Where had he come from in China? Which province? Uh, Guangdong province, because he speaks Cantonese. In the beginning we met, uh, he don't speak uh, well Mandarin. Do you know how much money he's worth, or was when you met him? I cannot give an exact number, but I think he was um, like a billion uh, uh, Hong Kong dollar at least. Did he have a lot of uh, buildings or oh, industries yes. on Macau yes. and also on Hong Kong? And also in China. And also in China? Yes. Yeah. How about Taiwan? Did he have anything No. There? Nothing in Taiwan? No. Uh, how did Ng uh, make his money then? Was it from some of these industries? You mentioned textiles, for example. No, textiles, he didn't make money. By, by doing the sale and buy, at that time, nobody was involved in uh, construction. But since 1991, con uh, you know, the buildings booming so fast. I believe I have all his bank, not all his bank, most of his bank record in in, on, in fire, on fire, because of when we try to buy the Camelot Hotel, they request the background of the investor. So I think he he have a, a, all the financial statement on, on his uh, business. Was he mostly putting the money from different investors in projects, or did he have already the money? Oh, to I think spend he people projects? because. Uh, the way I look at him, first he worked real hard, and the second he's a very smart man. He know the number re real well. So I think people invest him to, to purchase, because uh, some uh, uh, sometimes the Chinese people cannot uh, go out the com country. You know, it's not uh, in that time it's not easy. Even now, it's not easy to go out of Hong Kong or the Macau. Now is uh, Hong Kong is better, but in that time it's not easy. So people want to do business. They always want to find some people, can free travel. So he involved the Nanvan Lake project. Now, did you meet some of his business partners over time? Yes. What type of people were they? Uh, one person, he sell jewelry. One person, he's doing travel agents. One people is his uh, partnership in the, in the Nanvan Lake as a project. Did uh, those business partners want to have opportunities in the United States? Where did they ever discuss No, no, that? no. They, they mostly, mostly they are interested in the, uh, especially for Mr. Wu. All he want to do is buying, and all he have, the, even now, he have uh, thousands unit, unit of the apartment unit. He tried to sell to people, thousands. So that's why all he concerned is uh, sell to his uh, apartment. He don't know uh, f the way he told me. He didn't have an education. All he do is know how to hard work. So he interesting is the real estate project, and uh, in that time I think he they are facing financial difficult in the Nanvan Lake project because it was a real big project. So he was thinking, you know, uh, if there's uh, American people, because there's American, lots of American companies going to Hong Kong, but the Hong Kong real estate went so high, it's five, almost uh, three to five times more than Macau. So he bought a lot of building. 
And uh, sometimes you bought building is not to say you pay how much, you just uh, sign the deal, then you resell to people real quick. But I think he stuck on the Nanwa Lake. Uh, were these business partners from his province in China? Were they friends from, say, a long time back? Yeah, most of, the, most of them are. Uh, what type of uh, backgrounds did they have? There's some uh, government official, which is a city mayor, I remember. There's a, a gentleman name. I, I, I couldn't recall this man, but I know his name. And uh, he, uh, that's where Mr. Wu from. And they, was, uh, they know each other a long, long time. Also, some people, uh, I, most people is a business people. So what they do is, uh, like, uh, I have a building. So I just tell you, to can you buy it? That's what happened under Wang Jun. His assistant called Wang Xu tried to buy his uh, complex building in Guangzhou, which is next to the tr uh, subway. That's what he, that's how they do. If I have a building, if your company want to buy it, I just go ahead and sell to you. When I buy this guy, I probably don't have to pay. But when you buy it, you pay me. Then I repay to them. Did you ever have the thought that uh, maybe money was coming from China to go through them as a conduit, not for politics, but for business? And uh, did you feel there was ever a relationship? Never, because I've been with him so long the way he spend money or the way he do business. The important thing, he doesn't even speak English. And we didn't even get along together on the language because he don't he speak Cantonese. I speak Mandarin. But after he been with me, he learned Mandarin. But in Beijing, everybody speak Mandarin. He had no way to go there and tell people to, to influence something he don't even know. I don't even know, that's a problem. Well, it's pretty well understood that the uh, People's Liberation Army in China have investments both in China and uh, the countries that ring China, uh, and they had substantial money for this. So I just wondered if any of your feelings were that money was coming through the People's Liberation Army. No, because when I know him, he already have so many business. That's not just a coincidence that he tried to know me and his star have money. No, remember when we, when, when I know him, not long, not a little bit later, we went to Little Rock, Arkansas. His company have a financial center for the many years already. So, you know, I believe he make the money already. Not a coincidence. And the, the way I feel is that he is a real estate business. So we involved is try to sell real estate in that time. Well, he probably hit it at the right time of the market. Yes. If it's any relation to our economy. Uh, did uh, Mr. Ng have any business with the Hughes Company, an American company? No, no. Or any of its subsidiaries? I don't think so. All, everything I know he have is a build a building. He have a two building in Shanghai, in Chong, uh, Chengdu, and uh, uh, Harbin, and Guangzhou. He have uh, many, many building. Macau, and uh, I don't know Hong Kong. He have office in Hong Kong. Uh, were Mr. Ng's uh, Chinese business partners that had not gone over the line to go to Hong Kong or Macau or wherever? Oh, they do. They, they, when the, when they, if they sign the contract with them and buy the building, they are allowed to go there. Just like the U.S., we, we were issued an invitation for them to come. But Macau is uh, real close, so a lot easier than come to U.S. It's a beautiful place. Uh, why does Ng, uh, does he have any business dealings that you know of with the Chinese government in terms of official government agencies that are letting him put money in the area outside of China? No, I don't know where is that. How about any money from Taiwan? They're always looking for investments. Did he ever have any money from Taiwan? No, he, he me and him just went to Taiwan, try to locate the investor. But when people come in to, uh, we did bring people back to Macau to help him try to sell the building, but people didn't, uh, as far as I know, didn't went through. Uh, do you uh, have any feeling that uh, he had relations with Chinese intelligence officers? Um, he 
No, I, I, I don't recall that, but you know, because of the way, if you look at him, you know, you will not deal with him in, in, in something like this, because he's just trick businessman, for I look at him. Well, if intelligence officers had money, would he be looking for money from them? And in the case, he might he might introduce me as a, you know his friend, you know, but I I never recall. Just like a, it, did he did business with a, a, a city chairman Wang Jun or not? I don't even recall. Because I I, I don't worry about what he do because all I try to do find a. Because it's a big commission if I find any people to go into the, the number like is I think is a billion dollar. Well, it was shown and still is in Russia when it was the Soviet Union and I think in China, the people that ran the intelligence operations had a chance to leave the country, put money in places outside of the home country, and uh, also to uh, take money with them because nobody was really going to search them in terms of at least in China or in Russia in the case. So I just wondered uh, if you felt in any way that uh, he was involved with them in planting money on projects, hotels, office buildings, whatever. Uh, be honest with you, most time I see he give money to people because the people come to Macau need to spend money. I, I, I remember he have helped people, but I never see people give him money because he's a huge businessman. So he was investing his money, you're saying? Yes, sir. And was it mostly in Hong Kong or was some in China, I believe you did say? Most, most money is in China, but Macau is have a one of the huge project. Uh, did uh, much of the money go to Shanghai? Yeah, he have a two of the uh, uh, residential complex. Is a one is a twenty some floor and uh, another one is thirty some floor. Mr. Mr. Horn, if, if we could interrupt you, Mr. Waxman has a couple questions, and then we'll try sure. to resume with you in just a few minutes, Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Tree, in October of 1997, uh, David Wang testified before this committee, and he was under oath, and he said that the Democratic National Committee fundraiser, John Wong, came to his place of business in Los Angeles and gave him cash in return for a campaign contribution. And according to Chairman Burton, Mr. Wang's testimony was the first time in my memory, as he said, that we have seen evidence of such blatantly illegal activity by a senior national party official. He was talking about uh, Mr. Wong. During the same hearing at which David Wang testified, however, I introduced documents, including eyewitness statements, that show that Mr. Wong was in New York on that day, the day that Mr. Wang claims that he met him. And in December, when John Wong testified, he told this committee that he had nothing to do with Mr. Wang's reimbursement. Maybe you can help clear this up. I understand that you were asked about David Wang's contribution by the FBI, the uh, 302 interview, the report of their interview with you. Uh, the notes indicate that it was you and Antonio Pan who reimbursed David Wang, not John Wong. Is this right? Uh, can I have a background this, uh, Mr. Wong? Is he a car, a car dealer? Yes. Oh, yes. That's a miss. It's us. It's a, I didn't give him, I didn't reimburse him, but it's Antonio Pan reimbursed him. Um, and Antonio Pan was your employee, wasn't he? Yes, sir. And uh, Antonio Pan was the one introduced me to meet him. When we were in LA, was a, I think it was a Silla Temple time. Had you was that the only occasion you met Mr. Wang? One or two times I I can't remember. One time I was in his uh, a car dealership uh, the, the the lot. Well, let me ask you this, just so we have it very clear: Did you and Mr. Pan reimburse David Wang for his contribution to the? Democrat? I believe so. Was John Wong? 
in any way involved in or aware of the reimbursement of David Wang? No. Well, I think that that that's clarifies from what you have to say and what Mr. Wong had to say, that there was an error in the testimony we received from Mr. Wang. It wasn't John Wong, but Mr. Pan or you that was responsible for making uh, the reimbursement to him for his yes. contribution. Uh, I have no other uh, questions, uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time and let others pursue what they wish. Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Uh, did you have further questions that you wanted to ask? I do. Uh, yeah. do, you, do you know how much time you will require? Now, let's see. <laughs> we might have quite a bit more time. Uh, we are trying to conclude by six, as close to that as possible. Uh, can, can we go ahead with who, who's next on this? Mr. Barnes. Could we uh, go ahead with Mr. Barnes and come back and try to conclude with uh, some of your. You want to do it next week or now? Uh, no, uh, today. We'll, we'll okay. try to come back and conclude with you. So we'll yield to Mr. Barr. Uh, Mr. Barr. How much time do we have, Mr. Chairman, just so I can gauge? Well, that we, so we, we want to try Horn to and Mr. conclude Shays. by 6 o'clock or as close to that as possible. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I, yes. I have questions as well. I understand. Well, why don't we try to, would it be possible for you to limit your questions to 10 minutes? Certainly. Okay. Um, Mr. Treat, uh, I believe uh, earlier in response to some questions, uh, the name was mentioned, uh, Maria Han uh, Xiao. Yes, Maria correct? Han Xiao. And uh, she introduced uh, you to uh, Mr. Ning Lap Seng. Is that correct. correct? Uh, okay. You have known her for quite some time, is that correct? Correct. You incorporated a company called Sanyu Science and Technology Enterprises, is that correct? Correct. And was one purpose of that company that you incorporated in the U.S. to conduct business with the Sanyu Scientific and Technology Technical Industry Group in Beijing? Correct. And uh, Ms. Uh, Maria Han is connected to the San Yu Scientific and Technical Industry Group in Beijing. Is that correct? Yes. Did you also incorporate, or you did also incorporate, a company called Premier International Investment, Inc.? Yes. In 1995? Yes. Now, this company never did any active business, did it? No. <clears throat> Who is uh, Mr. Chen Su? He's the uh, one person I met in L.A., one friend of mine called Ding Sao Guang, uh, Ding, Sao, Ding Sao Cheng. He's kind of a superpower, natural superpower person. So we've been talking, you know, what's the superpowers, like a religious. And uh, he really know how to perform on the super the superpower in China. No, in LA. And uh, yeah, I, I I remember I brought him to uh, Little Rock. Uh, show the magic. To do what? Uh, do the superpower thing. In Arkansas. Yeah, in Arkansas, in Little Rock, Arkansas. Also, I, I remember I uh, bring him to Washington, D.C. You know, he just wanted to know people. He wanted to try to do the show. He was uh, president of your firm, uh, the Premier International Investment, Inc., was he not? Can I see the paper? Well, I don't know that there's a paper. Uh, it's my information that he was president of the firm. Is that correct? I, I don't think so, but you know, maybe his friend let him be the president. I, I remember I was an agreement with another gentleman. Well, let, let's, let's go back to basics then. If, uh, sure. if you don't know that he was the president, who is the president to your company? No, normally uh, I will be the one. Okay, are you, are you the president of Premier International Investment, Inc.? I think so. 
Uh, are you? Because I have uh, so many companies, I don't remember this, this name. I, I remember this name, but who is the one president, I, I cannot tell you. I, I so you're telling us you have so many companies, you don't even know what you're the president of and what you're not the president of? Some, um, some of them I know. I, I, I commend you for being able to say that with a straight face. I'm impressed. Is Mr. Chen Su the president of Premier International Investment Inc., or has he ever been the president of the firm? I don't believe he actually do anything for this corporation. Okay, so if we have information to the contrary, that information is false. But we was working together, so I don't know who is the one, because this company never do any business. In that time, just some company, so they can come here to business. Who is who is uh, Mr. Chiao Shi? And you, he, he can pronounce better. I mean, uh, I couldn't recall this name. Uh, but you can recall the name of Chen Su. I can remember Chen Su. Yes, Chen Su. Even you, I mean, what is, what is the name of his godfather? Oh. Uh, I couldn't remember the name because he just, uh, that's a Chen Zhu tell me. Well, he told you it was Chao Shu, did he not? Oh, yeah, also he said Chao Shu, yes. Okay. But you that know, you, I, uh, later I find out I don't have to believe him. And he is a high-ranking official with the, the PRC. Yes, that's how many of these superpower people use those people's name to support their, you know, activities. Well, and, and that would be a reason why you might have made him president of your company, because... No, no not, that's not the, that's a, never will be the reason. Really? So, because so when he, you say they, they you, you brought people in because they played the superpower game. Yeah, but uh, I don't believe he said that uh, his godfather will be somebody, you know, it's those people just say something. But to this company we did together with another gentleman, I, I couldn't remember the name right now. But if I look at the document, I will know, I can point out the, the person's name. That's very common, so, you know, to just join venture to a company. But later on, maybe, you know, we don't work together. This company never done any business. Mm -hmm. uh, I, for, in certain types of industries, it is common to create a number of shell corporations, and I'm sure you're not, your attorneys are familiar with creating shell corporations that never do any legitimate business. Sometimes we call them conduits for money laundering. Sometimes they're set up to launder money for campaigns. I, I understand. Are you familiar with the Grand Union Corporation? Or is this another one that escapes your recollection? The Grand Union Corporation, incorporated in Washington, D.C. in February 1996. Yeah, it's me and Peter Chen formed the Chen. company. Okay, so you remember Mr. Chen? Yeah, Mr. Peter Chen. Okay. And he was president. I don't remember the, who is the president. I couldn't remember who is the name on the president. I, I, I know it's, it's very difficult. All these companies and names floating around out there. You don't recall describing him as the biggest guy in the trade center? No, smart guy, smart, st smart he's very guy. smart, yes. Okay, uh, and is that why you might have made him president of Grand Union Corporation, because he was a very smart guy? Mm, could it be. Could be. Who is Mr. Mo Kin Ching? He's a lawyer, he worked with Mr. Peter Chen, they are trying to buy a building in Hong Kong. Is he connected with uh, a company under the control of the uh, Xinhua News Agency in Beijing? 
Excuse me? Is, is Mr. Mo Kin Ching connected with a company that is under the control of the Xinhua News Agency in Beijing? Uh, I met him several times. Oh, I know, he's a lawyer in Shenzhen. He was the first lawyer practice law in Shenzhen. That's why I know his background is a lawyer. So you're not aware of the fact that he is connected with a company controlled by the Xinhua News Agency. You're not aware of that. I couldn't recall that because uh, that was Peter Chen. Peter Chen is my brother-in-law. Everybody he introduced me, I talked to them. Okay, let me uh, move to one other company, the America Asia Trade Center. Uh, this was incorporated in 1996 also, a banner year for incorporations. Uh, are you familiar with that yes. company? Yes. And are you familiar with Albert Young? Why? Yeah, Albert, Albert Young. He's in Hong Kong. Yes, I, I, I know him. Okay, you, you know him for a number of reasons, including that he lent you $200,000 that you never repaid. Is that correct? Correct. Did that company also, that is America Asia Trade Center, receive a $100,000 wire transfer from the CP Group? Correct. And is the CP, the, the CP Group is a client of Pauline Ken channel like is that correct? I don't know that. Then you also would have no knowledge, I suppose, of why the CP group would send the $100,000 wire transfer to you. I know that. Okay, and why was that? That's what we, uh, they were trying in that time. Of, if I remember correct, is a shortage of uh, cotton, which I did one time. They wanted me to provide all the information to all the, on the Mississippi River, on the cotton, where to buy, where to, to, you know, it's just a work a deal. This $100,000 wire transfer, uh, was it also connected to a uh, June 18th, 1996 White House coffee? Or was that separate? June, can I look at? June, June 18th, uh, Mr. 1996. Wang White House Coffee. No. Okay, the America Asia Trade Center did receive a $100,000 wire transfer from the CP Group on May 30, 1996. That is correct. Uh, correct. And we have <coughs> Exhibit 314, which shows that. Is it your testimony that you had no knowledge that the CP group was attending a White House coffee the very next month in June of 1996? We probably talk about the CP group of two different party. One CP group is in Thailand. Another CP group is in Hong Kong. I believe they are the chairman are brothers. I know the person in Hong Kong. So we probably, we have a two separate scene. And finally, um, also with regard to the Asia, America Asia Trade Center, uh, Mr. Marvin Rosen, uh, you're aware of him, are you not? Yes. The finance chair of the DNC. Uh, did you uh, ask him to serve as general counsel for the America Asia Trade Center. I believe so. And that was also in 1996? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Shays. Thank you. Um, Mr. Tree, I would like you to turn to page six, seven of your statement, and I'd like you to read a paragraph after I just read 
uh, first paragraph. You said, by mid-1995, I had been involved in political fundraising for about one year and knew about official, knew many officials at the DNC. Around that time, I met a businessman who told me he was working on a project with Winston Wang in Silicon Valley. I knew that Mr. Wang's family owned a large company in Taiwan called Formosa Plastics. I was always looking for potential business contacts for my international trading company, and I thought Mr. Wang may be a good person to get to know. Mr. Wang's associates knew that associate knew that I was a political fundraiser and asked me if I could try to arrange for his boss to meet the president. I agreed to look into it. I'd like you to read the next paragraph. Next. Read the next paragraph, please. This is your statement that you didn't read today. I check with my contact in the DNC and find out about the president's presidential coffee. I'm not sure whom I spoke with, but I think it was probably either David Mercer or Richard Sullivan. I found out that for $50,000, contribution to the DNC, it were possible to attend a coffee meeting with the White House, meeting in the White House with President Clinton. Thank you, that's fine. Now, is it your testimony that you could basically, for $50,000, uh, buy your way into the White House and meet with the President? Yes. I'd like you to um, turn to page 11, and I'll read a first part, and then I'll have you read a paragraph. On our way back to the United States from a business trip in Taiwan, we stopped in LA to visit the temple. Now, the temple, um, visit the temple, where we stayed overnight. That night, we were able to meet Master Xing Yang, who spoke to us, and some other guests about his religion and their faith. We did not talk about fundraising or politics with the master. The next day, now why don't you read the next paragraph. The next day, a couple of master's followers asked Mr. Payne and I if we were interested in helping the temple organize a fundraiser for President Clinton or Vice President Gore. They told us the Vice President Gore had visited the Buddhist temple in Taiwan when he was a senator and had said that he would try to visit the Sea Light Temple in LA. They asked me if I thought it was possible for them to get either the president or the vice president to attend the event. I told them that if they were able to raise enough money for the election, it might be possible and I agreed to help when I got back to D.C. Just read one more paragraph, please. When I got back to Washington, I called Jiang Huang at the DNC and told him about the temple's proposed event. I told him that the temple appeared to have a lot of money and it might be a good source for contribution. Mr. Huang told me he would look into look into it and get me get back to me. Thank you, Ms. Tree. And, and then you point out later that you were no longer contacted. But basically, you introduced the idea of a fundraiser at the temple to the DNC. Is that not correct? Is that uh, correct? Yeah, to Jianghua, yes. So this whole event basically started uh, as a campaign fundraising event. Is that not true? For me, for me, the idea of this event was as a campaign fundraising event, and you helped initiate it with the DNC. Isn't that correct? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'd like you to look at the list of. Uh, tree contributions and solicitations. I think we brought it up earlier. If we didn't, uh, it's not, it's a document that we prepared that um, we, I want to introduce into the record. 
And um, I want to say first, Mr. Tree, it's our understanding that basically from Mr. Wu, you got about a million dollars. And from Tommy Renata, you got approximately 400,000 to 600,000. That's kind of the range we're at. And that from um, Summa Shing uh, Hai, you basically directed 600 to 800,000 to the President's Legal Education Trust, oh, excuse me, Expense Trust. Um, a lot of money here. Uh, but this is a list of the money that, that you uh, say on the record, you did not know was illegal, but it's all laundered money. It's money that other people contributed uh, originally, and you paid them back. I think there are one or two that we probably have to take off the list. Um, is there any, um, I just want to ask you to start, I mean, some goes to the DNC, the Dashiell campaign, uh, the Clinton-Gore campaign in 96, the Matsui campaign, the White Mark Warner campaign, the Fund for Democratic Leadership, the Fund for Democratic Leadership, Tom Daschle, Tom Daschle, Tom Daschle, Tom Daschle, Tom Daschle, the Clinton-Gore people for Wineland, the DNC, the DNC, the DNC, it goes on, the DSCS, I guess that's the Democrat Senate campaign committee, Daschle for the Senate, which I guess may be different than Tom Daschle, a lot of those, um, Evren Bayh, um, mostly Braun, uh, a number, and then a lot for the DNC. And we're talking over $700,000. Uh, without being certain of everyone on this list, uh, does this list um, account for some of the uh, money that you basically, I use the word conspiracy, I don't think I've been able to uh, uh, get you to accept the fact that it was a conspiracy, but it certainly was laundered money. Um, this is money that you gave um, through other people. Explain to me one more time why all these different organizations had to have other people give this money to them and then why you had to reimburse them. I can understand your comments about the 12500 but why all the dashel for Senate? I think uh, there's some mistake in this. Uh, more than half of the money I didn't really reimburse. Now, that's just a mistake on the record. Okay, so you're going to come back and say that half of this is not uh, money that you basically laundered. Is that, is that accurate? I can think of a few. The Jim Woodson International, the CHY Corporation, probably, um, the uh, Cooper Smith, uh, but any others? Like uh, Yogesh Gandhi, Gandhi, uh, Pauline, I don't know how to pronounce it. Well, here's what I want you to do. CHUY. I'd like you to come back to the committee when you're taking the deposition, not deposition, but you're being interviewed by our legal firm staff, sure. and I'd like you to go through each one of these um, and tell us which ones were uh, your money and which one wasn't. I will. Okay. I have another line of questioning, but I don't think I have the time, so I think I should probably... Thank you, uh, Mr. Shays. You've been uh, very, very helpful today. Uh, Mr. Horn. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to uh, move, since we don't have much time, uh, to uh, the group that is known as the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, otherwise known as CPPCC. Uh, were you a member of that? And what is the purpose of that particular group? So I, I didn't get the group. The Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference. Uh, yeah, okay. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm not a member of the, yeah. the group. What, what is your understanding of the purpose of that particular group? Oh, my understanding of those people is uh, uh, people after they serve as a government official, when they retire, they were going to the position. Are they advisors to the Chinese government? I believe so. On what fields? Economic development? What? I don't know exactly, but I know that's just a, a, a title for people retire from the, like a mayor or a governor, they retire, they go into the 
So it's what we would call a very prestigious yes, organization. Yes. These are people that have been government officials, yes. military officers. Yes. And uh, what else would make up that group? Sometimes I, uh, well, even like a... Any Americans in it? I don't know. Might be, you know. American Chinese can be join that. So I, I, I never ask because I don't think I, I will be one. Now, uh, Mr. Ng became a member of that group. Yes. Why, how did he get to be a member? I think if you do, uh, I believe he, he contributed 20 million to the police uh, and the city. So people people give him an honor because he from the province. That's how they give it. It's just a local. It's, a, it's not a, another uh, high level. It's just a local. Hong Kong, the 20 million Chinese dollar. In, in Hong Kong dollars or No, US? no, Chinese dollar. Equal oh. probably two or uh, two million US. My notes here say from other sources that Mr. Ng gave $2.4 million to a Chinese city government. Does that ring a bell with you? No, uh, you mean the US? US dollars, yeah. Yeah, I, that's what I heard from him, say, you know, he been uh, uh, two points a million to the Chinese government. That's why he'd be honored to be the the party you just mentioned. Uh, now, uh, do you know the particular city government to whom he gave the money? I think it's a Guangzhou city because he has uh, lots of projects in the Guangzhou city. What's the relationship of this conference to the communist government that runs China? What's the relationship? Oh, this is just a local, you know. I, I, as far as I know, in the center of government, there's a, have a, a people, uh, Linda, one of your group, and, uh, national and there's another car, national assembly. So every city have a same, similar, this same group. But you know, sometimes it's just a whole bunch of people name will be in there. It's just an honorable title. Uh, let me move on here to another relationship. Uh, what do you know about the relationship between Mr. Ng and Winata? Oh, Mr. Ng, uh, Wu. I'm sorry, you guys used a different Go one. Go ahead. And uh, he know Mr. Tommy Winata is uh, introduced by me. Uh, when we went to the, 19, when, in 1994, when the APEC, Mr. Wu, never attend any kind, this kind of uh, meeting. So he came with me to uh, Jakarta. So we met Mr. Tommy Wanada in that time. And I, I'm not saying I introduced him, but we're together so he know him. But hardly they ever any do any business. Uh, does the Consolidated Trust Company mean anything to you? Consolidated oh, Trust Company. Consolidated. Oh, Consolidated, yes. Uh, that's uh, 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 his, uh, his name is uh, William Bai. And he's, he invited me to, l uh, after I introduced him to Mr. Wu, he be, become Mr. Wu's uh, uh, financial consultant. Well, as I understand it, uh, what kind of business does Consolidated Trust do? Uh, consolidated, they do stock broker. If we look at uh, Exhibit 249, uh, there's a February 23rd, 1995 letter to Consolidated Trust from the Hong Kong Securities and Futures Commission. And in February of 1995, were you made a director of Consolidated Trust? Correct. Okay, so that is correct. And according uh, to Mr. Pei, uh, it was so the company could establish business in mainland China. But uh, he and Mr. Ng thought that Mr. Tree had more connections there than they did. So they didn't do much business, apparently, in China. Or do you know differently? Mm, uh, Mr. Wu mainly business in China. William Bai don't do business in China. He doing business in Hong Kong because of the stock market in Hong Kong where he know more. Now, moving to the United States, it, uh, you and Mr. Ng participated in the bidding of the Camelot Hotel in Little Rock, Arkansas. Yes. 
And uh, what uh, was Maria Shaw's participation in that project? Ma Maria Han. Yeah, Maria Han. Oh, yeah. Uh, because she introduced me to Mr. Wu, so I was invited her to join Mr. Wu. She have a restaurant in the, she do a trading business. Also, she have a restaurant in the Capital Hotel in Beijing. So, so she also invited a, a president of the Beijing Hotel uh, president to come, but I think he didn't make it. We just tried to come here to look at the potential this uh, uh, Camelot Hotel can be uh, renovated and uh, purchased and what to do. So they we call, all come in the same time. Uh, do you know if Maria Han Shao has any relationship with the Chinese government? Uh, when I uh, uh, met her, it was through the Changchun City, uh, Mr. Zhao Zixian, and uh, introduced me to her. Was in Shenzhen. She had the call some overseas uh, trading company, and uh, also she have a restaurant in Beijing. <coughs> but I, uh, she told me she was in the military and she retired from the military. But she's. Uh, Sorry. The time I met her, she probably said like a 35 years old, but she, I think she make a pretty good business. So was she active uh, ever in China in terms of projects there? <coughs> yes, he do sell like a corn, Com commodity uh, sell. Uh, during uh, Ng's visit, uh, did you meet in the Excelsior Hotel, Excelsior Hotel with Ng, Lauren Fleming, and Dwight Linkus? Yes. And what was that all about? They the investors? No, Mr. Fleming is, uh, 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 is my old, old friend. He's uh, electron, he owns an electronic company, electrician, also the uh, he was trying to help us to, because the uh, Kamala Hotel is have to totally re renovate. He's trying to do the electrical part. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, the Dwight Lankas, he's uh, want to help us uh, negotiate with the city, because he 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 used to be a city board director. He want us to he want to help us to to get the bed. Now, Linkus has uh, said uh, that Inc. handed you cash, maybe about $20,000, at the uh, meeting in March 1994. Is that true? That's a real possible. <clears throat> what, uh, what did you do with the money? Have a good dinner? Uh, Maybe he just uh, tried to pay the expense, you know, he, 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 he and a uh, <coughs> whole bunch of group of people coming with me. I Didn't th no. go into a politician's pocket? I mean, mm. what happened to the 20,000? No, no, in that time I never done any contribution in that time. Probably just spend it. Or maybe give it to the uh, flaming or something. I couldn't remember. But, but that's uh, only by his say. I couldn't re re recall that, but that's possible. But you agree that it was about twenty thousand dollars that you were given by Ng? I just don't rem. I don't remember. <clears throat> How long did Ng stay in the United States during that visit? He came over a week in or so. March. How long did he stay in 1994? Uh, I think in a week or so, because we just uh, uh, look all over the uh, camera and get all the paper work to, and he provide what he needed to provide. I don't think it was too long. Uh, he traveled where besides Little Rock? Hawaii. Has, uh, Hawaii. Been, yes. So he got out of Arkansas and headed for Hawaii to get back home. So Is that go it? to Beijing, yes. Well, if you look at Exhibit 250, it's a currency transaction, uh, transaction report for Mr. Ng. And I guess I would ask the question, were you aware that Ng brought $80,000 in cash with him to the United States when he came over here on March 23, 1994? 
No. We I, know I, you got 20,000 of it, but there's 60,000 left somewhere else. Is that in some politician's pocket? Mm, in that time, we don't know nobody. That's a... You're saying that's none a of that early, money went in into that, Democratic politics? None no, they didn't. Uh, no. Mr. Oh. Horn, uh, are you pretty close to finished, or...? Well, I'll th just do one last thing, and that's were individuals involved in the Camelot deal aware that uh, uh, Mr. Ng was the source of the Diatsu Group's money? Uh, I'm sorry, sir. In other words, were your investors in the <coughs> Camelot? Oh, no, no, no. I'm just will be the. In that time, I didn't have a joint venture with. Sir. Oh, yes, Mr. Wisdom, why, the Was big the one. Yeah, people know that. <clears throat> but Had only they because given he you any other money? Sir? Had Daiatsu given you any, mother, any other money? That but you admit they were the source of the money. And uh, that was... Uh, Sir, Daiatsu is my company. Daiatsu is my company. Yeah. Mr. Wu, in that time, we haven't formed any company yet. Just try to purchase the Camelot Hotel. That's the reason he come to U.S. <clears throat> okay, well, I thank you, and I know we're over the time that we said we'd okay. adjourn. Well, we have just a couple more things we want to clean up, but we really appreciate your participation, Mr. Horn. Thank you very much. And what you didn't get to, our staff will go through with the lawyers and with Mr. Tree. Uh, I, I'm going to take just a couple minutes. Uh, I'm, I'm going to yield real uh, quickly to uh, Mr. Shays, who had just a couple things he wanted to uh, follow up on, and then I'll close. Thank you, Mr. Tree. You're going to get on your way real soon, and I thank you very much. You, you made it fairly clear in your statement that you, uh, that the uh, Governor Clinton came into your restaurant, but after he lost the election, he still kept coming, and you got to know him as a friend. Um, and you got to know the, the, the then-defeated governor, and then you, over time, uh, as friends, wanted to help him in his gubernatorial race and, and ultimately presidential. I'd like to know how long you've known Mrs. Clinton. About the same amount of time? Yeah, sometimes she come with uh, <clears throat> then-Governor Clinton. Would she come often with the governor? Or no, she wasn't that often. Would she come an, uh, once a month to your restaurant? Or? No, no, no. Um, you said you held about four or five fundraisers for Bill Clinton in your restaurant. Did Mrs. Clinton attend those fundraisers? No, I don't, I don't think so. You also said that you worked on Mr. <coughs> Clinton's campaign. Was Mrs. Clinton aware that you were helping her husband in the campaign? I don't know, because in that time, I don't even know. I just had some people asking me to to put a donation of food. I just do it in my restaurant. In the 1994 <coughs> presidential gala, the 1994 one, uh, you have a picture with the Clintons, which isn't unusual. That's the one you contributed 100,000. Oh, okay. You and your wife, and then the yeah. 600,000, the 60,000 in soft money. Did you speak to Mrs. Clinton at that event? Did you have a chance to, to visit with her at all in 94? Yeah, we... Uh, in the uh, uh, receiving land, uh, land with uh, take picture with her, right. she said something, you know, because Did we she recognize you as, uh, you know, a but I think a, a president recognized me every time he saw me, he recognized me. Um, in exhibit 60, there's a list of attendees at the February 16th, 1995 dinner at the White House for the DNC managing trustees. On the third page of the exhibit, you are listed as attending the event. Did you attend that event? This is the 1995 um, DNC managing trustees. Was that exhibit six, <coughs> Mr. Shanks? Uh, it's exhibit 60. 60. I apologize. I could actually break through that and yeah, just, do you remember that event, Mr. Mr. Tree. Can I look at Which one? Okay, we're gonna go to 66. Did you visit with the First Lady at that event? 
I, I haven't looked at this one because... Okay, uh, well, why don't we uh, refresh your memory and took exhibit 62, which indicates that you were seated at her table. Surely you would remember if you sat with the First Lady of the United States. I know her, but I don't know. But you don't, you, don't, you don't remember sitting at the table with her? I mean, unless our records are wrong. He's a DOC. Yeah, he's, I don't remember this. I don't remember. I don't remember. <clears throat> I don't remember this uh, event. You don't remember sitting at a table with Mrs. with Mrs. Uh, Clinton. Yeah, I just don't remember. I don't remember. Um, on May 19th, you arranged for a White House tour for a large group of people, including your wife, Wang Mei Tri. During this tour, did the First Lady see your wife? Yes, that's what my wife told me. I wasn't there. <clears throat> but uh, but as, as our records state, she, Mrs. Clinton saw her and went over to her, and uh, obviously she knew her. Um, and she then did what? I remember, <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> I remember my wife told me she brought a friend to the White House and the uh, first lady met, uh, saw her, just give her a hug and uh, uh, take her to the surf floor, uh, surf floor to show uh, the <clears throat> residential. We're coming uh, almost to a close here, but that's an unusual opportunity to be invited into the personal uh, uh, living quarters of the of um, of the president, the first lady. So obviously, your wife uh, knew her fairly well. Did your wife know her better than you knew? I don't know that. Okay. Because we we uh, attempt some uh, <clears throat> like the what you call the one I said the top. In nineteen ninety four. In nineteen ninety four, that and me and my wife sitting in the table. We are the only Chinese, I think, they remember. <clears throat> remember her, my wife. Right. Okay. Um, did you f speak to the First Lady in Little Rock about going to the Beijing's Women's Conference with her in September of 1995? I you, believe so. And do you remember what she said to you? I say, I try to bring this one. I, I, if I tr remember that, I used to say, I say, I know you are going to China. I wish I can see you in China. She said, yes, uh, you'll be more welcome. You can, something like you can talk to my uh, staff. So <clears throat> you, you clearly had a relationship with the First Lady uh, if she was willing to suggest that you come to the, to the White, you know, that you contact someone in the White House about going to Beijing. That's a, a, a heck of an opportunity for any American citizen. So. Um, I envy in, uh, that you would have had a relationship with a first lady or president that would give you that opportunity. Did you ask uh, the invitation be extended to anyone else? You, were, you wanted an invitation to go to Beijing. Did you ask that if anyone else could come as well? No, I don't recall that. Not to, not to talk to her. No, but did you did you ask her if someone if others could come as well, or did you ask the White House if you could get an invitation from for anyone else to to be in Be in Beijing with the First Lady? I don't recall that. Okay, I'm almost coming to a close. <clears throat> uh, around Christmas time in 1995, did you send a pearl necklace to the First Lady? I believe so. Yes. Why did you do that? Love them. You love them. Yes. Yeah, I, I, and, I, and I appreciate that. Um, they've done a lot for you, and you respected them a lot, and you cared about them. Uh, what was the necklace worth? Somewhere from 1500 to 2000 I think. Right. <clears throat> and uh, 
do you know if the First Lady received that necklace? No, I don't know if she received or not. Oh, yeah. I think she received the one... Didn't the, she? The, 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 okay. Yeah. Go ahead. No, okay. Okay, I think uh, one day we were in the receiving land, uh, land she say, uh, thank you for the Christmas gift. So I think I remember a staff of hers so asking me how much is that one. I say somewhere around the, uh, I, the way I tell maybe it's around the 2000. So it's fair to say the first lady knew you? Yes. So if she denied knowing you uh, or having a difficult time remembering you, would that surprise you? I don't know. Well, you gave her two thousand dollar, fifteen hundred to two thousand dollar gift. She thanked you for the gift. She knew your wife and invited your wife. I didn't know what she said. She didn't know me. I didn't know the. No, that would I be a, the fact. That, that would be a surprise to you if she would say that she doesn't know who you are, or doesn't recall you, or doesn't. Only thing I, I remember, she know my name is Charlie. Okay. Thank <clears> you very much, Mr. Tree. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, let me end up by saying this has been a very frustrating day for me. You know, uh, you have uh, what uh, a lot of others who have testified before us have had, and that's what I call selective memory loss. They remember things they want to and things they don't want to, they don't remember. Let me ask you one real quick question. In May of 1994, you went to a DNC gala, and uh, you took a bunch of guests with you, you had one table. Uh, you gave $100,000 to the DNC, and you didn't have a very good table. Did you uh, ask Terry McAuliffe to get you a better table? I did. How much money did you give him <clears throat> to get you a better table? I think $500, $600, just for appreciate. He moved the table. You gave him five or six hundred dollars because you appreciated him getting you a better table. Yes. He initially said he couldn't. He said everybody wanted to get a better table, didn't he, initially? He first said yeah. everybody wants a better table, didn't he? I, I guess so, but I don't know. I don't really know <clears throat> if I can see the picture of the, the, I mean, the table, because there's a picture in there. I will know how far he moved. I but, he, I couldn't he, but at first he said, everybody wants a better table. Oh, yeah. I think so, yes, I, I believe so, so. And so then you gave him a gift of five or $600 and you got a better table. I don't recall, is that after move the table or before move the table? Well, let me just uh, conclude by saying that uh, one of the big concerns that we've had has been the connection between the people that you got conduit contributions from and the DNC and whether or not those people were connected to the leadership or the Communist Party in China. Ning Lap Singh, who was Mr. Wu, gave 15000 to the DNC on October 10, 1994. He signed the check in Chinese, and he was uh, a member of one of the organizations in China. Uh, the DNC records show that they even knew that the money came from Mr. Wu, even though he was not a U.S. citizen. He was a member of the uh, communist Chinese, uh, of a communist Chinese organization, and he had contacts with a friend of his who he brought to Washington, and I believe to the White House, Wang Jun, who was the head of CITIC, that's tied right in with the Chinese communist leadership in Beijing, and uh, may have been connected to Chinese intelligence. Uh, Colonel Lin Ro Qing, or Ching, uh, uh, you gave her, or asked her to give $10,000, and Exhibit 59 indicates that uh, you wrote a letter asking that, uh, saying that he was sending 10000 and that Colonel Lin had given Colonel, uh, 
Colonel Lynn um, was an official in the People's Liberation Army, and uh, the $10,000 uh, did come, as I understand it. Tommy Wayanata funneled at least $50,000 into DNC through three different contributors. Wayanata, uh, Wayanata is an associate of uh, Lu Chao Ying, who's a colonel and is a colonel in the PLA, who funneled uh, $300,000 to Johnny Chung, is that correct? Wenata has other contacts with the Chinese government and was also known by the Riotti family. These are three examples where foreign individuals with close ties to the Chinese military or the Chinese intelligence uh, organization made substantial contributions to the DNC. Uh, it, it seems very possible to me that, uh, especially with some of them signing the checks in Chinese, that the DNC knew what was going on. Uh, these are the same people, DNC, who say they didn't know what was happening at the Shilai Temple. Vice President Al Gore said neither he nor his advisors knew that that was a fundraiser. And yet, when Mr. Wong sat at the very place where you're sitting, John Wong said that uh, uh, David Strauss, uh, Mr. Strauss, who used to be the head of the DNC, and Don Fowler both knew that that was a fundraiser, as well as all of the people that were associated or who were aides uh, to the vice president knew that it was a fundraiser. And so it's very difficult for me and many members of the committee to believe that the vice president didn't know it was a fundraiser when it seems that everybody else who was there did know it was a fundraiser. Uh, as uh, I said earlier, I've, I've been very frustrated today because a lot of the things we thought you were going to tell us today have been like extracting a, a, a wisdom tooth from a person who's got it wrapped around their jawbone. But hopefully, because of the agreement we've reached with your legal counsel, uh, our staff working with you and your legal counsel will be able to get answers to all the rest of the questions that we're very concerned about. And uh, we'll be reviewing those after you complete that uh, one or two day meeting with our legal staff and your legal counsel. With that, uh, I think we've covered just about everything we can cover today. Uh, we appreciate your being here and we stand adjourned. Michigan Congressman John Conyers 